And we do this in a very easy way. What we do is when you produce vaccines, it's called a batch. It's like five liters of vaccine. You take out a tiny sample. to AI, you know, you have a batch in AI as well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the AI in it. Yeah. So basically you take out a small sample from the batch. Then we use a very advanced form of microscopy. It's called electron microscopy. So we magnify up to 100,000 times and we see the tiny particles. And here we come to the, to the magic. Mm -hmm. Then what we have developed is a image analysis software. So basically we extract information from thousands of images and we find particles, we count them, we measure their size. We look if there's aggregation, broken particles. And one of the main things to look at are the particles empty or full. In this yeah. case, they need to be full with a piece of genetic material that we're going to insert into the patient and create immune response. And how can you see that? Can you see that from the image itself that it's actually empty or full or? Yeah, so if you take out a tiny, tiny sample, that's thousands of virus particles. So, so when you magnify and, and look at it, it's like Google Maps looking at Sweden and yeah. looking for a cat, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can find there are many cats in Sweden, like 10,000, 100,000. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with virus particles, it's full of virus particles. Mm -hmm. So my work as a researcher was actually to count them manually. <laughs> that was called oh, a PhD. So you, <laughs> <laughs> so you had these super, super huge images and, and you zoomed in on them and counted the number of particles and... Yeah, exactly. So the problem with the, having the data in the form of images yeah. is that they're open to interpretation. It's more like religion Subjective or and, yeah. very... So what the <clears throat> computer science or image analysis software provides is the um, uh, objectivity, the specificity, mm -hmm. And above all, the, the possibility to count thousands and thousands of particles, extracting the information, and then you can have the statistics and compile it into report. Mm -hmm. I'm simplifying it now, no? <laughs> as you know. And and if, if we talk about the, the whole uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. and, and could you tell us the, a little bit behind the scenes story? Uh, yeah. What happens? How does it work? When, you, when do you get into the process? Or how, how did that all go about? Yeah. So it's actually fascinating how fast we managed to develop vaccines against a new new virus. So I wouldn't say there are any new viruses because the viruses, they, they're around. But the problem is with the jump from an animal source to humans. So this is the case with the COVID. Before it was swine flu, bird flu, we had MERS from camels to, to humans in Saudi Arabia, and then now uh, SARS from um, uh, so bats. I think that's what you just said is interesting and, and mm. news for me at least. So there isn't really new viruses being developed that often. It's usually just jumping from species and then. Yeah, they, they are around. Yeah. And, but, you know, there are some viruses that are clever that have been around for a long time. For example, yeah. my, my I started with herpes viruses. Yeah. Fascinating creatures. <laughs> People Make, love it. So. Yeah, you, you, you kiss and hug and they spread. <laughs> but above all, they don't cause severe disease and death. Yeah. among us they, they live with us like a symbiosis so that's a clever virus mm -hmm. so a virus basically the the meaning of life for a virus is to reproduce right basically like humans and animals yeah. what's but, the difference <laughs> exactly but what they do they infect us and then they use our cells as factories to produce more virus that's basically what they do mm -hmm. but if they do that and they coexist with us then we don't get sick mm -hmm. we don't die we don't even develop disease so for herpes, for example, you just get blisters mm. when it's sunny or you're stressed or I shouldn't talk too much about <laughs> herpes because then I get a lot of questions. <laughs> but basically, so, so that's a clever virus. Then there are stupid viruses that kill us like Ebola. Uh, if, you, if, if you get Ebola and you, like, your nose start to bleed, yeah. it's virus production. Yeah. If you get a common cold mm. in your ear or your nose or your throat, that's virus production taking place. Right. Causing a symptom. And, and if we go into COVID now, can we elaborate a little bit? Like, so this is yeah. coming from the animal kingdom, but but could you sort of educate us a little bit about what what okay. what is this virus all about? Yeah. So, so there are some revolutions going on in science, not only artificial intelligence. For example, gene editing. Mm. So when a new virus pops up, we can sequence it very fast. It is in, in a matter of days they sequence the, the genome of the virus. Is that by using like the CRISP editing tool or? Exactly, CRISP editing and also just sequencing. There are many ways of sequencing things, yeah. many machines and you can. So, so in this particular, when we got COVID, how, how many days until we had actually a, a sequence on it? I think it's just a week, seven or eight, Crazy, or yeah. 10 days, uh, because, you know, you need to make sure that it's the right strain and, and you know, you need a human strain from a few patients to, to, to be sure. And with that, if you, if you have a genome sequence and Another revolution is then, it's called gene therapy. 
to insert a gene into a patient that lacks that patient and cure disease. And if we look at Nobel prizes as a good credibility that a new technology is good. So we had 2017 for electron microscopy, the technique we, we work with, right. 2018 uh, curing cancer with gene therapy, like lung cancer, mm -hmm. skin cancer, amazing um, things. So with the, with the sequence, we manufactured sequences of the genome. It's called RNA. So basically, usually it's DNA, but RNA is even better. Before, because, we, before we go to RNA and DNA, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the sequence, there are many different sequences, right? Yeah. So you have the DNA sequence and you have uh, amino acid sequences and et cetera. Yeah. What type of sequences are we talking about right now? So, so DNA, that's the first. Yeah. Deoxyrubonuclease. So you yes. can dominate in discussions after <laughs> uh, this. I will never remember beer. that. I know and from DNA, that's the code. And when you read it, you put together a chain of amino acids. Yeah. Then you're creating a protein. And a protein is a building block of something. But DNA turns into RNA before you put mm -hmm. together the amino acids. Uh, you lost me at the RNA. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what's, so that, the, what's the jump from DNA to RNA? What, yeah. what is that all about? Yeah, so, so, so DNA is the template to make RNA. And from RNA, RNA is the template to make the amino acid chain. Mm. And an amino acid chain, a polymer of amino acids, that's a protein. Mm. And a protein can be small or big. But a protein is usually a building block. Okay. In the body or in, in anything? In the body, exactly, yeah. 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 So uh, a, a unit of life. So, so, if I, so how, do, how do I really understand the difference between DNA and RNA? Template of a template, you uh, explained it, but. Yeah, it's like if you have, uh, so DNA is just four let letters, A, T, C, G. Mm. And if you put four together, it's called a codon. And that's a template for one amino acid. Okay, and then you can, Build, build on that. Yeah. yeah. So if you find a new virus, you sequence it, then you can, you know, try to make one of the proteins from that virus and usually choose. You just said, you know, we just sequence it. I mean, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah it sounds I mean, so simple, isn't it? <laughs> but you can't really, you know, I, I guess you can't really extract the full sequence in advance. You have to sequence some samples of it in some way and then put it together, right? Yeah, exactly. You take out a sample from a patient, you isolate it, you purify it. This is people in white coats yes. doing magic. Uh -huh. They get it out, they have a magic machine, they put it in, they get out of a sequence on the computer, mm. still magic. So there's still a process here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is, a, this is a yeah. high tech, very high tech, extremely high tech. But this also, it's like if, com if you compare with computer science, if you see the computer power today or how much data we can store or, or the, how quickly we can, uh, you know, do calculations today, it's the same with sequencing. We sequence, sequence the whole human genome around 2000 and now 2020, you know, we can sequence any, any person's, uh, sequence. They did it the first time I took it probably took a year or two or three. <laughs> now you can sequence, sequence the whole human genome. Just and why, why does it go so much faster now? Is it because you have faster computing power or is it because you have better algorithms to actually do the sequencing or what is the, the reason behind the and, and hardware, how to do the sequencing itself? But and also science behind it. Yeah. Of course, yeah. the CRISPR revolution. Yeah, the CRISPR, yeah. yeah. So a little bit back to the story now. So mm -hmm. so we went down a rabbit hole now, but I think it's good to sort of set a little bit of... Uh, You're digging uh, deep here. Yeah, <laughs> this is education. We love Genetics. it. Genetics. But so this is... But if we relate back to the sort of co COVID story, chronological story, mm -hmm. you know, what happened? Uh, okay, the sequence, they, they had a sequence in a week. Yeah. And what happens next on, uh, to, to the path to a vaccine? So the good things here with the pandemic is that everybody knows a little bit about viruses, vaccines, yeah. and, and how it goes. But not on this level. <laughs> no, not on this okay, level. Okay, but let's try to simplify it. So you, you sequence it, then you know the book, the instruction manual, how to build that virus. Okay, then we're going to pick something that the human body, the immune system can recognize. So usually they pick what's on around the virus. The virus is a circle thing, like mm -hmm. a soccer ball. Then it usually have some uh, things on its surface. So you pick one of the surface proteins. And in the case of coronavirus, COVID is easy, it's just one. So you pick that protein and the sequence for it, you produce mRNA, you put it into an empty virus capsid that you produce. We can manufacture virus particles now. Mm -hmm. Then you put the mRNA into that virus particle and that's what you inject. And now we use the word mRNA. mRNA. Yeah. mRNA. Let's call it just genetic material. It's easier. Okay. So there are two types of genetic material. So if you have a cell, you have a, a, a core, mm -hmm. that's where you have DNA. 
Mm-hmm. When the DNA is translated into proteins, it goes out to inside the cell, outside the, the nucleus, mm-hmm. then becomes a protein. And then it can go out of the cell or sit on the surface. So when you were talking about mRNA, we are on sort of on, on the next, nu- the nucleus is the DNA and RNA, RNA and all that kind of stuff. And then when we put that into the meta, yes. uh, uh, I don't know what, what's so the right let, word. Let's so. say there, uh, there are two types of viruses, RNA viruses and DNA viruses. DNA viruses are more advanced. RNA viruses are simpler. Uh, an RNA virus don't need to go into the nucleus of the cell. They just go through a cell membrane. They put in some RNA and the cell starts to produce the building blocks. Yeah, so the, you basically, you, you fool the, the cell to take over and start producing, uh, reproduce the virus rather than doing what it should be doing. When this ends, you're gonna have a master in biology. I'll, I need this, I need I, I need don't know if I'm that. accredited to give it, but. <laughs> no, no, could we, could we get that on paper? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, no, but I course. think we could illustrate this to make it educational. Yeah. yeah. If you go f- yeah. through yeah. this, which is actually. Yeah. Yeah. If you put it, you know, so you, Mm. Show it. Uh, no, no, I guess there are a lot of mathematicians listening to this. So this <laughs> is a, na- uh, uh, an, a wonder of nature. Yeah. The, the geometrical form is called icosahedr. Oh, so it's pentamers and hexamers with uh, the laws of nature forming this icosahedr with the lowest amount of energy possible. Mm. And the building blocks, that's the proteins. So the proteins form hexamers and pentamers, and they form the icosahedr. Is that enough I, mathematics for you? A, <laughs> no, no, how you many, can go, go how down. many surfaces does an icosahedr have? Yeah, that's the question for the, the listeners. What do they win? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A t-shirt. Okay, okay. If we have anyone, on how there. many surfaces on an icosahedr? How many pentamers? How many hexamers? Yeah, th- those are easy, I think. But yeah. Okay, but you, you, okay. Let's I know, not go but, there. Mm. Interesting. So back to this, I mean, like, okay. So, but just to show the picture, if, if this is just a capsid, it's called a capsid. Mm-hmm. This is what you fill with a piece of genetic material. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is, it's called gene therapy. We can now, we master how to produce virus particles and we can insert a piece of genome that someone lacks. You've heard right. about hereditary diseases. You lack mm-hmm. a certain gene. So we can give that patient the gene they lack. And there are many companies like Spark. Mm-hmm. They manage to cure hereditary blindness, for example. It's like science fiction. You've probably yeah, seen yeah. it on YouTube. They get the, the, the shot and they take out and they start to see. Yeah. It's like magic, science fiction. But, but you in, enter that into a single like, cell or, or how can that spread out yeah. through the body? And- yeah, so you produce, you manufacture thousands of particles like this. This is like producing vaccines that we were yeah. talking about. A vaccine is just you're manufacturing viruses, yeah. but you have <clears throat> made those viruses a little bit handicapped so that they can't, don't cause disease or, or death. Mm-hmm. Okay, so basically you use this AAV. So that's, that's a virus particle. That's yeah. a virus particle. And then Very you can fill one. it. Mm. Very common one. This is yeah. the most common one. Yeah. Are there no associated virus? Yeah. And this one is used in, in it's called in, uh, gene therapy. Yeah. And the revolution has really been in gene therapy. But when the pandemic started, we used the tools from gene therapy to make mRNA vaccines. Basically, right using this virus particle, Mm -hmm. putting in a short piece of mRNA from the COVID that Mm -hmm. we had sequenced, and that was the mRNA vaccine. So you heard Moderna Therapeutics. Sounds very simple. It is. But this is essentially what uh, Moderna did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only studied 20 years to, <laughs> to do this. So. <laughs> and did you, were you working with several of the companies or mainly yeah. one of the uh, mm. uh, pharmaceutical companies in, in this, uh, from your point of view? So, so we have uh, 15 of the 20 major pharmaceuticals as recurrent mm-hmm. customers. We also wait, work with a lot of SMEs that are very, very specialized and the world leaders in gene therapy. V- very good uh, companies coming straight out of top universities. Mm. They are niche players. Some have viral vectors. Mm-hmm. Some know how to manufacture them. Some are good at putting in the mRNA into them. Mm-hmm. And we have a history of working with something called drug delivery. Before putting in genes, we were using this similar technology to de- deliver drugs into patients. For example, if you have cancer, cancer comes in many forms, different cell types. Maybe you want to target just that specific cancer cell and kill it. That's so called like drug melanoma, delivery. for instance. Yeah. So then you just want to target those kind of cells mm-hmm. and that's called drug delivery. And then it, similar things is um, gene therapy. 
So you could basically, so you have over the time then, you, you did something, you've been working on it there, and you could apply that technology and that approach to gene therapy. Yes. Yeah, so the <clears throat> this is not a, the first pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we worked a lot with influenza virus. That's mm. our background. We, we have developed drugs against viruses. We worked with all the manufacturers developing influenza virus vaccine. And you remember there were some problems there. Yeah. And, and, and uh, when you look back yeah. at the, at, at this, uh, or maybe think about this, like in, in 10 years time or in 20 mm -hmm. years time, when you, when you look back at, at, um, this as, as, as an event, how would you summarize what your key contribution was to sort of, to, to get to the right vaccines and where we are today to sort of get back to normal? Well, I, I can take all the credit for that. No, no, but no. I, but I think what's really, really wonderful is it shows a lot about the, how the scientific discoveries of today or very recent one have been applied so fast. Mm. And, and I think the problem is not only the science, is that a regulatory framework. Mm. In order to produce a drug, it usually takes like 10, 15 years and costs one to $2 billion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now what we did with COVID, we developed a, a vaccine within two months, six weeks. 42 days. Yeah. Actually, Modano. Yeah. So yeah, 42, 42 days, days, but then of course you have all the trials and all that kind of stuff. So and, you, and what th that's usually the big hurdle is the trials. Yeah. It's like clinical trials. You yes. go through like, it's called preclinical phase one, phase two, two, three, and manufac manufacturing is actually a big issue here. I ramp up the, ramp up the production. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the bottleneck to, to do the, for that too many hurdles, of course, <laughs> first one is this has cost a lot of money, yes. you know, so these modern vaccines are really, really expensive and we should be very proud about AstraZeneca who, who, you know, they are the ones who, who very early said, we're going to do this nonprofit. Oh, and it's just very recently that it changed to, you know, mm -hmm. charging, especially Europe because they complain so much, <laughs> 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 but Sweden or AstraZeneca is really contributing to vaccinating the, the whole global population, not only the rich or Europe and US, but the global population through WHO. I think that's important too. But I guess, you know, I'm asking too many questions now because you move into so interesting topics, but we should do Great. a proper introduction We, we need to do it as soon as a proper <laughs> introduction. A little, bit, just more, a little bit, more. bit more. This is so fun. This is so fun. But also so this is all about biology. When is, when are we coming to artificial intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think this is the key topic, right? Yeah. AI on its own is worth nothing. Mm. You need to have the fundamental first principles ideas. You have to have the business problem, mm. the medical problem, and then understanding how they infuse. So for me now to go nuts on the real business mm. problem, yeah. and then understanding how AI r relates, I think it's core. And I think yeah. that's sort of missing the point if you're not deep on the, on the fundamental problem you're trying to solve. So I love it. Mm. So back to the question. Uh, to AstraZeneca's you know, point, and um, they delivered or did create the vaccine in a bit different way than Moderna, Dana, yeah. et cetera, yeah. right? W what was really the difference? So they picked it up from a university in the UK. Mm -hmm. So that's usually where the discoveries and innovation come from, universities, scientists, and then they start to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. Moderna, they picked it up from BioNTech, a German oh, company. Okay. So, but you need that big machinery because it costs so much. You need a lot of resources to, to develop it, manufacture it and get it out on the market. Right. And actually back. So the only problem here is the politics. Mm -hmm. So how to combat COVID, it was too much politics <laughs> and too little medicine. That, that's the problem. If you look at China, how they did, they, they just closed down the country. It doesn't really work here in Europe, yeah, yeah. but some countries applied it, not Sweden. So that's not medicine. That's something else. Yeah. You cannot really, uh, escape from a virus. But, but they didn't do an mRNA uh, vaccine, right? In AstraZeneca. No, no, all of them are using the same, the, the, the nice picture here, the AAV, okay. virus particle, filling it with something and, and um, administering it. Then there are the traditional, like old school vaccines. Mm -hmm. So actually vaccines, that was not a big business until uh, this pandemic. It's actually mm -hmm. India. India is the major producer of vaccines in the world. It's Serum Institute of India in Pune owned by a very nice guy, very clever guy. And, um, that, that's a high volume, low cost business model. I know you're the businessman here. <laughs> it's a high volume, low cost. So we're vaccinating the whole world. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. You no know, children used to die from childbirth and, you know, other things. Now we're vaccinating the whole, the whole world, but that's traditional vaccines. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is these modern MRNA vaccines coming out of this new technology, the gene therapy, 
and that in 42 days they managed to not only develop <laughs> it but also manufacture it and deliver it yeah. that, that's fantastic on prototype stage of course yeah but, uh, it requires a lot of money a lot of skills and a lot of logistics to do this and the thing we haven't touched upon is the regulatory framework right. and this is something from, from a company perspective as well you know uh, patient safety is Or it's, of course, basically, it's the government's yes. uh, problem, <laughs> and it's only the government who can decide about uh, approving a vaccine for emergency use. Because this is what we have done. Yes, we to have go to, to um, cut the red tape. Exactly. I told you, take 10 to 15 years and cost 10 to 20 uh, billion Swedish. Well, it still costed them one to two billion probably to develop it and get it out. But they did it in 42 days, and others now are still working on it. Uh, Then you have to, you know, the, the regulatory framework, the quality assurance, how effective they are. Well, we, we did some quick tests yeah. here. <laughs> and basically our company, Varianova, what we work with is the quality control of these vaccines and products. And uh, this is the hurdle when it comes to drug development today. It's very costly. It takes a lot of time. And there's, it's, this is because of the patient safety and the regulatory framework around it. Would But that I, be a good segue, perhaps? I, to I think this is, around? yeah. I think I think this is the segue to. I mean, like this was the you know two minute introduction. You know, having <laughs> yeah. a, having a hook to to get started in, in a cool way, and it's so fascinating. So it, two minutes, five minutes turned into 20 minutes, but but let's really do the proper introduction. Okay. So today we have the CEO uh, from uh, Vironova, uh, Mohammed, and we have uh, Mats, uh, old friend of mine, an old colleague of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's old friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I think we should start there. You know, how the hell did you two guys meet and what's the starting point for this journey I guess on uh, we go down to five five years old or something should, like that. Should we go back kindergarten? Back? Yeah, then then we go back to kindergarten. We are three or four years old. I actually do not know we're three or four. That's where we started <laughs> back in Pisk Setra. So two two Fisk Setra boys in kindergarten we have today as yeah. guests. That's yeah. where we start. This is the Maradona of Fisk Setra, <laughs> the best soccer player ever. We have a few. Yeah, second and third. I think we have some <laughs> bias there. I think we should talk about data and AI, but thank yeah. you for for promoting. And but we continued. Our yeah. road has been going together until we went to the secondary school. Then we took separate ways. Yeah. You went for medicine. Mm. I went for soccer. Yeah, mm. that's no, right. Business. Yeah, uh, business. Yeah, business and as soccer. well, and guitar Connor. and so forth. And, uh, yeah. And then actually my road crossed your road before I came back to you. Yeah, yeah. So me and Mats has worked together at Pro Sales. Yeah. And then you work with me for some time in Vattenfall as well. Yeah, exactly. We've been management consultants uh, yeah, both. Yeah, we've been consultants and we, I've been, you, I've been your customer and stuff like this. Yeah. yeah. Good fun. But, mm. but maybe a little bit back to you, Mohammed. So like, yeah. um, so what's, what's the starting point here sort of that takes you to Vironova if we can yeah. do that now, maybe not in 20 minutes, but in, in, okay. in 10, 10, 10 minutes. five, yeah. 10 minutes maybe. So I'm actually a scientist, as I said before, uh, disguised in a suit. So it goes back to, I, I love science. I have a passion for viruses. I started in chemistry, uh, Uppsala university. Then I went to, into biology still Uppsala University. And then I went to the Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm and I, I did medical research for like 10 years, focusing on viruses. So I started with uh, drug development, trying to combat virus infections, both with, you know, diagnostic tools, but basically it was to use my chemistry and biology combined to develop molecules as medicines against viruses. The strategy that I had was to disrupt the virus particle. Now we have talked about this icosahedron. Yes. We have this competition going on, how many sides, but so basically the strategy was to disrupt the virus particle, to break it down. That was the way to cure us from, from virus infections. And, um, my research, the data I generated was in the form of images because I was using electron microscopy to look at these virus particles, to actually look if I managed to disrupt them. Basically you, you culture cells, uh, you infect them with virus, then you add your compound to, Uh, pharmaceutical to be. Mm. And then what I did during my PhD was just <laughs> taking pictures. And then I sat with these uh, pens with different colors, red, green, and blue. I looked for empty particles, broken particles, and then I was counting them. Yeah. <laughs> and so it usually took me one week of taking pictures, another week of counting particles. And the third week I met the professor and, you know, the head physician and, uh, 
Then the problem was this this objectivity and subjectivity. Yeah. But here, here we have high stakes, high quality, really intelligent people doing very, very tedious yeah. data work. Yes, yes. It, because it's complicated. At this time, when I was using the electron microscope, as a very academic tool in the basement of the university, these are things that cost from 10 million to 30, 40 million crowns. It's like flying a big plane, a lot of different things that you adjust to calibrate it, to get a good picture. So you need to work a... a, a This that was a hard thing <laughs> to calibrate it, to find the virus, to prepare your samples to put into the machine. And then I went into the dark room with the, you know, with the red lights developing my images. But at the same time as I was, I, as I was working on these um, things using these analog machines, we started the digital, I shouldn't say revolution, but first came digital cameras. What year are we speaking about approximately? From right 2000. Now? 2000. On. Yeah. So we had the, the digital cameras. The first ones costed like a hundred thousand dollars, like a million crowns or two million crowns. Uh, now, now there are we are producing one for seventeen thousand five hundred. I shouldn't have said that because that's not, not what we sell them for. But <laughs> I mean, the, the price difference is huge, and, and how much better they are today than before is is also huge. We also started what what the goal of our company has been to automate and digitalize the electron microscope itself to make digital cameras. And we do two types of uh, software. Uh, I'm not Bill Gates, but we try to illustrate this with, we have an operative system that you know mm -hmm. runs the hardware, mm -hmm. uh, automation, make it user-friendly, auto calibration, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the office package where you handle the data. You generate images, you have to store them, you have to analyze them, extract information from them and compile that into reports with the statistics. And that's the customer value for us. There are a lot of companies, not a lot, sorry, three, that make microscopes, but we're the only one who really works with the data. What's actually the information in the images that are creating value. So you had, besides the hardware, also the software to be able to work yeah. with the cameras. But let's hold, um, hold yeah. on that. Because From a very egoistic perspective, it was tedious <laughs> to count yeah. particles. <laughs> but we, we get into the Verona stuff. But yeah. So you, you you were doing your PhD, yeah. but, but you're a dropout that went patent in cell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I blame it on Bill Clinton because <laughs> I filed a patent. I won a prize. I met Bill Clinton and, and Americans. And they, they just asked me, so how much does it cost for me to do the analysis with your software? I was like, what? You're going to pay me for it? I was so, paying 7,000 crowns a month. <laughs> but, but, but go back a step here because you yeah. figured something out. And what, what did you patent? Okay. So the first patents was actually a drug. The first drug against the virus was herpes. So I, we developed a drug that did what I just told you, disrupt the virus particle. Mm -hmm. And that was a good thing because the icosahedron, back to the symmetry of these capsids, it's mathematics. They all look the same. There are eight different herpes viruses, but the caps that look almost the same. See, if you develop one drug against one of these herpes viruses, we found out that it had effect against the other ones. Not, not a great effect, I can admit, but an effect. And this was really, really interesting because the problem with viruses is once you develop a drug against a virus, they change so much. They change on the surface, like influenza, and they search, um, change in the genome, like HIV mutations. Mm -hmm. You've heard about mm -hmm. that. But the icosa here is a conserved structure. It's the wonders of nature. Mm -hmm. These uh, lowest stable. energy to be the building stable blocks. Structure. Exactly, very, very stable. So if you can bind something between the pentamers and hexamers to destabilize the particle, a fantastic way to develop drugs against viruses. But this is what your patent was. That was the, exactly, that was the first uh, antiviral against herpes. And then we continued and we have done the same against influenza virus. Influenza virus is also common knowledge yeah. now. And you, you were staying at Karolinska. I mean, like you dropped out maybe of your PhD, but you were staying at yeah, Karolinska. Stayed. <laughs> Because the, the, the funny thing with, with the research is very similar to business. You, you apply for grants and that funds your research. So it's basically you take money and you create knowledge. Now we're on the other side. Now we take knowledge and we're creating money out of it. <laughs> so, but it's very much the same, you know? <laughs> I like that summary actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so we were very good at, getting grants. And actually when I started the company, I started the company, but I was still at the university. So Virunova is started out of um, Karolinska. Karolinska. Yeah. So my professor in chemistry that I work with, he's still working with us. Mm. He turned uh, 80 last year. John Very, Berman. We should John Berman. Him. Yeah. Shout out to John Berman. Yeah, he's fantastic. That's uh, one of the most clever people in the world. Definitely, mm -hmm. for sure. And I met a lot of clever people. He's 
outstanding. Yeah. Awesome. Better than internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Better than Elon Musk? Yeah, yeah. Don't have <laughs> no, no, for sure, for sure. He, he's got the, it's called the chemistry Bible, which is like German books from 19, I don't know what, 1850 something yeah. up until today. But he's still better than these books. And he thinks like internet is, is a new phenomenon. <laughs> the real knowledge is in these books. Yeah. <laughs> so so what, what was the starting point and the idea then like when, when when did you do sort of oh we can make a company out of this or this mm. or maybe even this uh, when us go back to bill clinton because mm. someone wanted software what happened yeah so so the first pattern was as i said it was an antiviral compound but it was also uh i i, I was collaborating with the mathematicians and people working with image analysis so i had a, a master thesis worker uh martin mm -hmm. doing his master thesis in mathematics with us He's now a PhD in artificial intelligence, oh, nice. uh, Department of Mathematics, Royal Institute of Technology. And Ida Maria, she was doing image anal analysis. She was a PhD student then. She's almost a professor now, assistant professor oh, in image Couture. analysis. Yeah, Couture. And, and they, there were two patterns, uh, two separate ones actually. One was like image analysis tools to look at viruses. And Martin was also doing a similar thing. And I was using this to show the mechanism of action of my drug. So we're three people doing this. And, uh, yeah. And then I, I published this. No, I didn't publish it. I patented it. Yeah, yeah, and actually my, my university <laughs> paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> and I stayed, <laughs> but when I went out to conferences to present this, then the, the American researchers, they were like, wow, Mohammed, this is good. Like, can, can we use it? Can, can you do this for me on my virus particles? And I was like, yeah. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to become a professor because, you know, if you do something for another researcher, they put your name on the article. So I was like, yeah, this is the way how to become a professor in biology. I'm going to sit and do this mm -hmm. and I'm going to be become a professor in biology. But then they asked me, so how much is it? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, but how much does it cost? Yeah, and then I have Moroccan blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you go back to, to be a statue. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? Mm, this is interesting. You're actually saying that you're going to pay me for this? And, and I made that joke before, but, you know, you're not well paid in research. That That's for sure. You work you know, 12 hours per day, weekends. And so, but it's because of research. It's, it's interesting what you do. You're it, passionate about yeah, your, your topic. Your problem domain. solving. Yeah. yeah. Problem solving is still the, the number the one motivation. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. But if you can make money out of it, even better. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's why I went with the, with the patents and I was actually encouraged to commercialize my science because at the time it was new. First, they, they, they forced universities or researchers to communicate with the outside world. That was the first thing. Tredje mm uppgiften. -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then we have something in Sweden called lärarundantaget, which yes. means if I'm the scientist doing an invention, I own it. And actually my department paid, helped me. I'm really thankful for that. They, um, they, they paid for Americans the first patent. don't have that. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But what the Americans have that we don't have, or we're, we're, we're now trying to do that, is the support system around commercializing science. So when I was a PhD student, we, we had the first like courses in how to patent science, how to write a business plan. And, and that was, that was nice that they encouraged it. So we were one of the first to, you know, patent it. I owned my own research. Yeah. I started the company. And what, when was um, Vernova founded? Uh, 2005. Yeah. And once, once we started the, the funding was actually grants. So we started with the, you know, Almi alone. I, I am also thankful to Esse Banken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Esse Banken. <laughs> They gave me a loan. I think that person is fired because <laughs> <laughs> giving a loan of 300,000 to a researcher, that's probably, but I still like them. And then, um, Vinova, you know, of course they gave us like 10 million to develop the software. We mm. talked about this that's before. A, that's a quite, I mean, like, it's that's interesting with, with, with Nova also, we have talked about it before. I mean, we had been over on the show as yeah, well. Yeah, we have been over great, and we sort great. of, is it good to have many small, small, small loans? Or do we need to have a little bit bigger yeah. ones or bigger grants? All of them are good. Yeah, all okay. of them are good. Yeah, 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 never send no to money. That's yeah. rule number one. <laughs> and what's really good, if you're a researcher, you used to, you know, write a grant. That's actually what I'm going to do this evening. I'm, I'm going to sit and review grant applications for, for a foundation. Ah. And if you cannot write a good application, you, you, you You probably shouldn't do anything at all about it. <laughs> Go back to the lab. No, but it, it's the same in business. You have to write a business plan and it's sales. You have to convince someone else mm. that 
you need this. And the grant is the academic way of selling and yes. pitching. Yes, and this is, as I told you, the, the first thing that the government forced upon universities, this 3D uppift and actually communicate, what are you doing? And that's, that's a challenge, but it's really, really interesting. That's what you're doing. You're con yeah. contributing with your pot here about artificial intelligence and the different applications. Yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah. I'm very tempted to go to a side topic here about the academic system and how I it think works we, today. Because I, I think we, we have reached sort of the storytelling up to Vironova, mm. and why, but, but why don't we go to the academic system as, as the bridge? Yeah, and I then think that's a short to, topic at least, yeah, but I, I think, think it's an important one. And, you know, I've been in the academic system as well after my PhD and continued to, to work. And, you know, I did what you said, basically you apply for a lot of grants and yeah. you try to find, you know, the right one to apply for and you adopt the application. <laughs> to what the you know reviewers will what you think the reviewers will like mm. <laughs> but it's like sales uh, it, uh, yes to some extent but then if you compare it to at least in ai today and the academic system has failed in some ways and the true research in ai today is occurring in the big tech companies and um, they basically have caused the brain drain from all the academic and universities they are paying high salaries for the top professors to come and work for them Mm. And it's it's just continuing in, and, and accelerating in a fast phase. And I would also argue, and, and please stop me and disagree, but uh, at least in computer science, the way that peer reviewing works today to publish article is is the, is diminishing and and going down rabbit hole that is causing people to just push push stuff in pre print pre print kind of you know archive.org kind of mm -hmm. sites to and fast like, pace. To just circumvent, you know, for one, to fast pace, yes. But also that the whole reviewing system is not working that well. And there have this kind of, what do you call it? Like in, uh, when you have a, a set of people collaborating to, together to to go around the normal reviewing system, you know, if you have and you know, know the right people in the network, you can get mm -hmm. the paper accepted just because, you know, you know X number of people that is close to the reviewer. And it seems to be failing in what's supposed to be the good, you know, purpose for peer, peer reviewing articles and getting, you know, publications out. Mm. And instead now the tech companies just, you know, I'm just going to, if you take DeepMind or something, they, they push this kind of super big article on archive, like 50 pages long. They perhaps get something in nature because they, they just, who they are. But in reality, they, they demand, you know, what should be published. And the, the universities are just, you know, Straggling behind more and more. Yeah. Uh, what do you th that the, at least for the AI and computer science part, that is partly, I would say, what's happening. W what do you think about that? But, well, from a company perspective, because I, you know, employ a lot of people, the mm -hmm. first problem I see is the shortage of the number of engineers yes. or the computer scientists at all. So what that means is before they even finish school. Mm where they're trying yes. to employ them. Okay. So it must be very, very difficult to have enough students, you know, taking their exam mm -hmm. and even more difficult to have them doing their PhDs. Yes. For example, uh, uh, one of our geniuses, Martin, he, he first he finished, finished as an engineer, but then he worked a lot mm. and then he went back. Right. And, and, and I guess that happens a lot with people from computer science that they mm -hmm. find out that, you know, it's not only about learning the latest program um, language, mm. but it, there's a new language every year. <laughs> yeah. But if, I mean, studying is all about learning a way to, uh, you know, handle a lot of amount of data and then giving it Accumulate back. Accumulate knowledge. But, but, uh, yeah. To but, learn, but you can do study. Learn to learn. You can do studying in, in companies as well. And, yeah. and I would argue that that is what's happening, with, at least with some tech uh, companies today and uh, perhaps in your companies as well. So the alternative then turns out to be should you do the studying, you know, at the universities or mm. should you switch to a company quickly and get paid to get educated? So maybe the answer is capitalism because the giants who are recruiting all these people, if you look at the U S and Sweden, mm. for example, we have people working with us and if they just go over there, they, they have, will have 10 times yeah, exactly. the salary. Yeah. But the reason they work with us is because it's the latest, the most complicated problem. And at the same time, we're doing something good. Mm. So I think the motivation among computer scientists and mathematicians is very much working with very complex problems or something that they like doing, like combating virus infections instead of, you know, 
selecting the the, the cheapest shirt <laughs> with e-commerce. Yeah, but, but there are many types of yeah. But I think thing. that motivation can at least circumvent some of the problems. But still, it's not really if if this kind of divide starts to increase more and more, and you get paid you know so much more to join these kind of companies. Would you agree that this is a problem that we need to try to fix somehow? Otherwise, it will be yes. concentrated into a very few set of companies. Yeah, I think we have a problem in general that there are not enough people studying engineering. Mm. And I, I have two daughters myself. They're 14 and 16. And when they're selecting what to study, you know, mm. they have music and dancing and, and mathematics is not e even, you know. Well, they had a few computer gaming kind of things, but that was all guys. Yeah. And uh, no. so I think we, we have to show the applications of mathematics and software and AI to the children mm -hmm. to make them curious that they want to do this, want to learn more because natural science is quite boring the way it's teach today. Right. If it's, if you don't show the applications mm -hmm. and maybe have some role models or companies or products that you showcase, this is this created by engineers. Like, but could you say that this is also this divide? Mm -hmm. That it's also geographically a difference. If you look, I don't think Europe has. A, yeah, Europe uh, don't have a single tech giant. I would argue. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. If we look to the east and look at India, mm -hmm. where we get a lot of applications from, yeah. as soon China. as we China and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. There we have a maybe not another mindset. We have a larger population, of course. I mean, like I, I think it clearly. Uh, what I have understood, it's it's fashionable to to do STEM type and you know courses in some parts of the world, and it's completely mm. unfashionable in other parts of the world. Yeah, I, I am very much engaged as a person now. For example, I work with the um, IVA in Swedish uh, Royal Academy of Sciences, and we have this huge problem about lack of competence to the Swedish industry. And if you look at the Swedish university today, we have very good universities. If you look at the world we ranking. We do, right? Yeah. So we actually are a small country, but yeah. very, very good universities. Yes. But if you look at who's studying in Sweden. Yeah. So for example, when I did my PhD, uh, we were 50% were non-Swedish. They came from all over the world to study at the Karolinska Institute. So basically, well, one thing, of course, the, the, the quality is high because of the Nobel Prize, for example, Swedish scientists in medicine, they can collaborate with the best scientists in the world because everybody wants to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so that's a good thing. We should use that. We should be proud of that. And also the amount of money that is, is like private money going into research in Sweden is fantastic. Yeah. It's just amazing how much money private donors are, are, you know, financing research with. And in Sweden, education is free. Mm -hmm. And when you do your PhD, you get paid. Yes. That's, that's a, unheard look, of. It, yeah, unheard exactly. Of. If you look internationally, like what are you getting paid for, to do your PhD? If we, if, if we should market that, we would be overcrowded. I think we should. We should market it. And but, this but, is exactly but, what we're doing is we're hiring but, people who are, have come to Sweden to uh, either take their master's degree or their PhD. And they already know who Pippi Longstrump is. We don't care about this if they speak <laughs> Swedish. But, you know, they are a little bit, you know, assimilated, you know, Sweden. And no, I certainly agree. And, and that's one of the, the biggest kind of pros that we have in Sweden. We, we have great universities. We actually have good ed educational systems and we get a lot of, you know, really uh, knowledgeable people that we can hire into companies. Mm. The problem is, can we keep them? Can we keep them when they, you know, yeah. you have them in some companies and then they see, you know, if I move to this country, work for that, you know, company, I can get X number of more uh, higher salary. Mm. And, and we can see this kind of brain drain coming, you know, from Europe to, to other countries, I would argue. Would you agree with that? No, I would say Sweden is one of the best countries at uh, integrating people from other countries. I usually call it kebab pizza, for example. <laughs> you have pizza and kebab, and in Sweden you have kebab pizza. That's a Swedish phenomenon. You take the best things from everywhere and you mm. put it together. Mm. Like the universities, if you have... 50% of the PhDs from other countries, but we should work more on keeping them. Yes. Yeah. They so stay so, in Sweden and work for these fantastic so, companies. So the, the, the core, let, let's zoom in on the, on the problem here. Mm. And, and I, I, we, we, I think we get another topic now and let's take it now rather than later because mm. the story, the storyline unfolds in, the, in this way. Yeah. So, you know, we are talking now about in one way, we are quite good at getting talent into the country to study. 
Yeah, that's what you said, right? I mean, in a way that we we're we, not we're not doing it on purpose. They are coming because the universities are yeah. good. <laughs> but how free, well how, well how well yeah. are we then to use that fantastic muscle or you know influx? You know, everybody who wants to run a, a soccer team, they know it's, you have a problem if you don't have an influx of players, right? Mm. And here we have an influx of players at at at, at sort of the ripe age. Uh, where they are not slatan, uh, you know, the the, the cheap slatans, the, mm. the rising star slatans. If I'm if I'm a soccer guy, but what do we do in order to keep them? What are we doing in order to get them back into the country? You know, because yeah. we have a, we have a flip side of this coin, and it's how hard it is to get talent into our businesses. Exactly. Can, could we elaborate on this sort of? Yeah, what's the story the, the, the here? Future, what's the future? The competition of companies. You mentioned these big uh, tech giants. Mm. What they are looking for is talent. That's the big competition. It's not money or so. There's plenty of money, but the talent, the people who are actually doing yeah. things. And if we get talents to Sweden and we attract them because of Sweden, the Swedish system, democracy, clean air, föräldraledighet, semester, all that, we should, you know, do everything we can to make them stay. Yes. But it, but this but is it, that's red a carpet. problem. That, but that's red a carpet. problem I mentioned, right? I mean, you get people here, but the administration study. is terrible. We have a company. Yeah. We have hired a company to help these people fill in the paperwork. Yeah. For example, we had a genius, a, a guy, he finished his PhD student in, in less than four years. Mm. <laughs> that was a problem. Oh yeah, the because course, the yeah. Book, it, it should take four years. And because he finished before four years, mm. he was not allowed to stay in Sweden. Yeah. We had cake uh, this oh, week for God. Ying Yi. Mm. After six years, she got her permanent residency. Right. And that's a genius young woman. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's just terrible. The administration is not there. But this is a huge problem for Sweden now, because mm. in, in the one hand side, we are with, with our taxpayers money, we're doing quite good marketing or somewhere they, they come to our universities. Yeah. So we sort of, we, we put the ball on, 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 on the penalty. It, it's right yeah. there on the penalty. You shoot, you just kick the goal. Yeah. And then when the talent is here and then we fuck up in yeah. my opinion. Have another beer, please. Yeah. <laughs> now we're starting to get into the, when we're talking about the system, it's hard to, yeah. to in the short run, uh, mm. in the short term, mm. but do the, anything about the system. But we have a, a Colombian guy and a Moroccan sitting here yeah, and yeah. we yeah. speak Swedish fluently. Yeah. We think we're Swedish. You are? Yeah. And, and the, that's the thing, the, the, the fascinating thing with Sweden. I, I said, we're good at integration. Yeah. Well, Compared Goran, to a lot Goran, of what do you say? Sure. Yeah. You see? Are, you, are we good at integration? So say yes. <laughs> no, but what we can say is that some mm. of the responsibility. Oh, go down. That's your work. Don't you feel Swedish? Yes, I do. Yeah. Mm. You yes. see? I, I mean, I, I watch uh, so much better. <laughs> Robinson, Sweden. I feel as incorporated in this country as everybody else. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, I have been here for sixteen years, so I have been paying them the tax. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm born here. Corporate. But I'm saying we're good at integration. Mm. It's, just, it's just a new phenomenon with this brown color in politics that should be taken away. No, but uh, on uh, on the matter of this topic, I think that the Swedish system is actually a loophole. Mm. So uh, uh, I can num I can number I can name actually a number of people that I know that are super highly quali uh, qualified to work. Uh, in Sweden, we are lacking around seventy seven thousand IT professionals. But in the same time, people that are coming from United States and all different countries that yeah. are basically want to work here cannot get a residence permit or a working mm. permit because in order to work here, you need to get social security number. In order to get a social security number, you need to actually get a job. Yeah. And if the company is not basically strong enough to, to uh, get you that uh, social security number, you will basically being in a limbo. Yeah. And after some time, what is happening is that people will basically move to another country that will provide that ease in order for them to work because they are coming to Sweden. They like the culture, they like the people, they like everything, mm. but they cannot actually get in. So you were talking about like, we are extremely good in uh, bringing students here. We're not, mm. right? We used to be. We can get more. We, we used to be, right? Uh, all the glory days that I heard about, like when Ericsson was founded and, and uh, Atlas Copco and SKF and, and Volvo and everything else. And that changed in 2009 because we changed the system, how we, uh, you know, for people to come in. So only the people from, uh, you can read it there. So it's basically, if if you are a European and Swede Switzerland citizen, the, the education is for free. What about those people that came from Pakistan and India that actually made Ericsson in the time? We're right? applying yeah. So, of them. so if we want to be controversial, it's not good, right? I'm a little bit criticizing this because I think that we can do much. Look at what Vancouver had done in, in, uh, with the AI and everything else. 
Mm. We need, if we want to bring uh, AI and the brain to Sweden, we need to change everything, not only the how the company thinks, we need to change the politics, the migration. Uh, we have awful right now uh, situation in, uh, in uh, finding actually accommodations. Mm. Yeah, yes. uh, I, I mean, totally agree. Yeah. So, uh, totally let me agree. Take the, com- take, the, take the microphone. Uh, yeah. 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 If we go back to Baru Nova and, and one of our challenges. This is the rant. Let's go for this. Yeah. Let's go with yeah, this. Yeah, but this, that was really spot good. on. That's spot one on. of our challenges. Yeah. We have geniuses coming to us. Mm. And as the system is not taking care of that, we as a company need to take action to support them yes. in soft variables. How can we support them to integrate them with Swedish language? We have Swedish language courses in three levels that we arrange individually. On But our just own because we, we, we do that because they want to learn Swedish, yes. we don't force them. We That's just a way to make them feel at home But, and comfortable and show, uh, socialize with each other. But you pointed out, you know, where should they live? <laughs> That's a huge problem. Yeah. And even, even for the students coming here to study where, yes. where the housing is it's very expensive. Now, we had, the, we had this uh, realization with Spotify that, mm. you know, you know, we, we, we had our center in Stockholm mm. and people that wanted to move into engineering, yeah. you know what, it was cheaper and easier to live in New York. I, I, I know. That's, that's, I know. Cool. that's ridiculous. Yeah. Cheaper, but, but it was faster to get like an apartment in central Manhattan. Yeah, faster to get the apartment in central Manhattan. Um, and even if they are well paid, you know, coming <laughs> to Spotify, they, they could easier and they have the money to pay for an apartment in Manhattan and they can do that. Uh, it's just get it in two weeks, but yeah. um, to get it in Stockholm, you either have to pay up like millions and millions of crowns to mm. buy something. But you cannot rent anything. No matter and I how think you the pay. hurdle for them was also the administration. Yeah. You know, to employ people from outside Europe is complicated. Yeah. And, and the US and, and Canada, they're really, really good at it. They're trying to attract talent. They're so, offering them citizenship. They're offering them a lot of things. So now we are really talking about the AI divide and AI, but we need to also tackle the right problems. So, and mm. the main problem in the AI talents. and everything is talent, yeah. right? It is talent. Yeah, well-educated people or people who have learned it themselves, doesn't matter, mm. but both of them are necessary. I, I think it's a shame. I, I think it's a numbers game. You, you mentioned that peer reviewing doesn't work, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, because it's hard to get a big <laughs> scientific community when they can earn a shitload of money working yeah. for a big uh, tech company. Yeah. But but let's flip it now. I mean, like we haven't even really presented Vironova in, in right. one way, but yeah. screw that. Let's go into the real <laughs> topic. <What's that? laughs> I'll do that later. What? <laughs> Why are you offering us beer? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. Should we, uh, cheers to Goran. No, no, the, the cheers to Goran. I have to, uh, okay, no, the guests can choose. Do we want to go into what Vrino, Vironova okay, is all do, about? Do a first? quick introduction. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I, I tried to do that. I'll do it again. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. So, so, so to the hardcore, I know yes. this is a uh, people working with artificial intelligence. I'm not good at it, but I, I, we're spoiled with some fantastic people working on it. So, so I said that I, I started this company is based on egoism. I had all these data in the form of images. Mm-hmm. I wanted to turn that into evidence or decision support, but because I still think that real intelligence is better than artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is, is fantastic. It's mm-hmm. fast, it can be accurate. If you have the right amount of data, you can train very good algorithms. And this is what we have done. We have taken thousands and thousands of images of vaccines. So what we do when you're producing these virus particles, either for gene therapy or for producing a vaccine, what we do is the quality control. Take a small sample, we take pictures, we look at the virus particles, are they intact, are they broken? How many are they? What's their size? These are parameters that the computer can do much more uh, efficient and faster uh, than a human being. Mm. It's, it's, it's just cumbersome. It takes a long time. And it's a, a numbers game. Yeah. If you can take it thousands and thousands of images, count particles, et cetera, et cetera, that's good. And to move into artificial intelligence, just because we have worked with this for 10, 15 years, taking all these images, we sit on fantastic data sets. Which are annotated. Yes, annotated data. Domain. Yeah, yeah. Really, really good ones. Because I haven't talked, we talked about, we touched upon the regulatory requirements <laughs> to do this. We, we're simplifying a lot. It's well-trained people. And we have these certifications in our labs, like GLP, good laboratory practice for the virus lab. And we have the world's first GMP, good manufacturing practice oh. lab for electron microscope. We should brag a little bit. Yeah, we <laughs> should do the, the yeah. first. <laughs> Yeah. And only. Yeah, yeah. It's the first. 
And, and that's a good thing. Worldwide. Yeah, that's the only one in the world. So it really puts Stockholm on on the in, on the map for the quality of manufacturing of electron microscopy. Yeah, the, the only ones who can use electron microscopy and who have managed to turn images into evidence. Because what the pharmaceutical companies do when we have taken these images and we have uh, looked at these variables, how many are there? What's their size? Empty full? We compile that into reports with the statistics. And they, that's what the companies, the pharmaceutical companies use towards the FDA yep. to get approval to produce and sell their drugs. So this is key in this 10 years, $2 billion, the cost and the time. Yep. It's really, really important. Patient safety. But I, uh, I used to cut in a little bit, like, because I think we have talked a lot about, you know, how to understand AI and how mm -hmm. it amplifies intelligence yep. and how we really want to automate data intensive type yep. processes. And I think the whole business model of Vir Vironova is mm -hmm. sort of explaining, edu educating a lot of people on how to think about AI yep. and where where you, you, you want to use algorithms. Yep. And you said, we I prefer real in intelligence, but I love artificial intelligence. Mm. It's about understanding what is data intensive processes mm. and, you know, so but I think in, instead good. of having an expert behind a very, very uh, expensive piece of equipment that is difficult to use, we worked on both, both things, automate and digitalize the equipment mm -hmm. to make it more user friendly, et cetera, and then try to replace the expert with the software. And you can do that for the simple things that I, I said, exactly. count, measure, mm. There are like 10 variables that a computer can do much, much better, mm. faster, and more accurate than a human being. But what we're good at is looking at the analyzed data and saying what it means. Mm. We have a saying, you know, that um, <clears throat> AI and humans are good at different things mm. and they're very different how they work. This is so the point. AI is really good at going through a huge amount of data, but does so very superficially. Yeah. Humans cannot go through thousands of images or a huge amount of data. Oh, you, you can. I did my PhD that way. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes seven years. <laughs> Good point. Okay, I rephrase myself. Yeah. Humans Don't cannot. Hate. Get, they hate to do it. <laughs> yeah. But humans cannot go through a huge amount of data in an efficient way. Thanks. Um, but they can go through a small amount of data in a very deep way, yeah. that much deeper than any AI can today. So then if you combine the two, which it sounds That's like it. you're doing, the combination, you actually use AI for what that is good for, going through a huge amount of data, doing accounting, et cetera, and mm -hmm. then having a human analyze the results of that, mm -hmm. you get the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We would say that like we have data acquisition, that's image taking. Mm -hmm. And from that, we go to the analysis, the fast forwarding, looking at thousands of pictures. Mm. You should really get our hardcore geniuses on here. Yeah, we, we yeah. talked about but, but, but mathematics, to, artificial intelligence, yeah. image, because it's it's just fascinating. I, you, I, you have to, I find it very, very let, fascinating. You have to go through a bit about the tech as well. You know, okay. How do yeah. you yeah. actually analyze the images? Yeah, for sure. Can so it started in mathematics and image yeah. analysis. I, it's called like pattern recognition algorithms. That's how it all started. And quite simple things, even for me, being just a hobby mathematician, I, I could understand. You look at these images, they're all in black and white, 250 shades of gray. Mm -hmm. and, and you're looking, the, the problem was the background. There's a lot of crap in yeah. the images. And then you're trying to find these tiny, small, round things. But if you can find the tiny, small, round things and find their center, mm -hmm. you can measure the radius and thereby the diameter. So finding them, that means you can count them, you can measure them. Measure them. And if you can measure them and you know where they are, you can see if they are next to each other or not. That's like aggregation yep. in the cross. And then you can find different kinds of particles, the empty and the full. We talked about this. Mm -hmm. If you're going to give a, a gene therapy or vaccine, they need to be full. Mm -hmm. And if you're developing a drug like I did, you want to see if they are there or if they're broken. Other quality control aspects. So from pattern recognition algorithms, we, we took a lot of images. And, and, and I mean, artificial intelligence, I don't even know if that existed as a term back in 2000. It was it, mathematics, it, it, algorithms. It, it has been around since 1956, I believe. But okay, still, sorry. Uh, this is the winter time. This is the winter time, yeah. I guess. But still there are a lot of, you know, at that time, it wasn't that in deep learning technology. But you know, this um, competition that is taking place every year where you're trying different algorithms when, you know, it was not until like 15 years ago that the real good I think you learned ImageNet the competition. Exactly. Right? So yeah. 2012, so you, it was the big yeah. moment with the Alex. And if you look at from thing. 2012 to today, how yeah. many different 
new algorithms or <laughs> ways pop up. Yeah. yeah. So that's where our science and our research is to try all these new ones on our data sets. Mm -hmm. But we, we started with pattern recognition and non, then we have trained. Learning. Was it even machine learning or is it more yes, like both a, machine learning, deep learning, neural yeah. networks? Yeah. What's CNN? What does that stand for? Convolutional neural yes. network. But where did it start? Because yeah. when it was pattern recognition, this is pre. Yeah, we, we, we started in pattern recognition. We started and now with it's mathematics and, and image analysis. So probably rule based in the beginning and then later turning into machine learning and then later deep learning with yeah. CNN yeah. type of. And the same models. people who were working with the image analysis and the mathematics and so. So, for example, Gustav, who's heading our R&D, mm -hmm. he did his PhD for Ida Maria, which is one of mm -hmm. the founders of the technology. Now he's head of R&D. Ida Maria, she's CTO, which is 50% in academia and 50% with us. So she knows what we have. So Ida Maria is at Kotiho as well. Or yeah, Uppsala or University. Uppsala, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So she knows the latest things and her PhD students. So they can try the latest te techniques mm -hmm. on our data set. So, you so have what a we data didn't set. realize is because of a service model, we have spent so much time developing software, we even built our own microscope, the world's first desktop version of an electron microscope called the Minitem. And we just did that to integrate software with hardware right. to automate and digitalize. Once we have done that, we focus more on the software, but all the data that we have generated over time, as we said, it needs to be annotated. Mm -hmm. That's why we, we built our own microscope, integrated our software. We bought a few companies uh, that made digital cameras to make a fully integrated system. And with that, we have generated a lot of data. And that data set is, that's the gold mine mm -hmm. of but, today. But okay, here I want to use stop and pause. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually uh, brag a little bit about High Price Data Innovation Summit, because I'm gonna get, mm -hmm. make a hook to what we're talking about here. <laughs> so so we, we talked about AI transformation as the main theme of this, uh, the Data Innovation Summit. And mm -hmm. when, we, when we start looking at contextualizing AI transformation, we're gonna have a transformative, it, this is all gonna be transformative, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be general purpose tech. AI is gonna be pervasive. I propose that you need to always talk about data AI software. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I mean, like, so AI and AI is completely transformative, mm. but you need the data in order to feed the AI. And, and what the, about the experts? Or, um, no, 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 uh, of you course. Them, or, <laughs> that's the people side. But if I look at, if I try to look at it, uh, good point. No, qu qualify the data, I mean. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was trying to, you know, technically people get stuck on, oh, it's all about the algorithm. It's all about data science. Oh, well, mm. it's all about the data, the data engineers. And then when you have the algorithm, you need to, to deploy that algorithm into production somehow, mm. i.e. software. So I just wanted to sh point that out that when we've been talking about this stuff, uh, you talk about interchangeably software, algorithm, data yeah. as core, core business perspectives. You can't take, I mean, like you can't have AI without the software. You can't have the software without the day, you know, do you, exactly. so I, I just right. want to make that point clear mm. uh, to, to really emphasize that software is extremely important. The algorithm is, you know, so none of them really has any real value without the other ones. Yeah. That's the point. And then the people, let's, let's then talk about how much it takes and how much it people yeah. and but process. I think we need to rephrase that because it, it's one common topic today is called data centric uh, AI versus model centric AI. Mm. This is from Andrew one Engie. of the Andrew Engie. pioneers called Andrew mm. Ng. Mm. Ng. And um, the traditional academic work, and this is the reason that, you know, there, ha there is a big difference between um, industrial and academic use of AI, because in academic use of AI, you usually have a fixed data set and you tweak the model yeah. and you tweak the model in the extreme uh, and do this kind of weird ensembles, et cetera, that is not really useful, but they win in some kind of competition and benchmark and they get a paper published. Mm. But in practice, what you can do is you can just tweak the data set instead, improve the quality of the data set, and that hugely will impact the performance. But how do you improve the data set? So for example, in our, uh, for us is we have experts who have knowledge about the data mm. and they can qualify the data. Mm. Is, is that possible to do just with software to qualify the data? Partly, yes. There, mm. there are a number of techniques like active learning based techniques that you can use to try to improve the quality of the data and, and choose what to actually train on. But um, instead of spending so much time trying to improve the model, you can instead say, 
is there some noise in the data that we can remove? Is there some noise in the labels that we use to train the model on that we can improve? Can we see that this type of label is potentially missing, um, you know, sufficient data, but others are overrepresented? Mm, exactly. So we can, you know, find a balanced way to make the model training work much better. Mm. And if you do that, then you know the improvement that you get is usually very much higher than whatever tweak you do to the model. But this is why I love science because mm. y- you look at this from a software perspective. But if you sit together with a chemist, mm. a biologist someone who's uh, you know working in medicine you will have so many angles on solving your problem so if you have a problem that is well you know let's say nobody have solved it before like eating an elephant yes yeah you have to eat it piece by piece or probably so, so everybody if if you have this in working interdisciplinary that that's a, it's so fascinating because you can have so many different views on the same problem so if you have one data set if you have different angles on it, you will see different things. So this is what I say with having experts who are used to, you know, yes. if you sit there hours and hours and hours <laughs> in front of the microscope, basically you just have to look at it and say, ah, oh, that's that. Yeah. I mean, domain expertise is super use- exactly. important. Of so course. Uh, the, the no way question. is the bad thing with uh, pattern recognition algorithms is we have taught the computer to do something. So it's expert bias. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we're trying to work on, you know, feeding the computer with images mm. and then just waiting for the computer to tell us what's in the images. Mm. And, and that's really, really interesting because when we see what's coming back, the expert can say, oh, wow, did you have that in the, but we didn't see it when we tried to analyze it. Are so, you moving into explainable AI as well? When the model is trying to explain why it thinks it has a sort of thing? <clears throat> have you tried that yet? Yeah, well, I, I don't know the, the, the nomenclature, but it, it, we're trying to go from teaching the computer to do something and teach it on our material mm-hmm. to towards feeding the material and, and trying to get something out of it, like what's in the image. So yeah. in short, you, you can basically today with a number of techniques try to say, let the AI not only do a prediction, let's say in your case, a number of uh, virus particles or whatnot, mm. But instead, also besides doing the part and the prediction, say, <clears throat> why do I think it has five number of five particles here, and it has to highlight an image basically, so we can yeah. motivate and describe why I thought you know this is the number of particles it found, and then so, you can see, oh, it actually looks at something completely horrible. There's a classical example of this. This is a paper from 2015 uh, mm-hmm. called "Why Should I Trust You," and it basically they had a really biased data set where they want to predict is if it's a wolf or a husky, a normal dog or a mm-hmm. wolf. The thing with, with the collection of data, they just collected wolf images from forests with snow. And all the dogs was from uh, like more domestic, domestic, domestic yeah, mm-hmm. from city kind of environments. Mm-hmm. And then you train a model and the model didn't even look at the dog. It just looked at the environment and see <laughs> yeah. every time you see snow, you know, it will be a wolf <laughs> Never. <laughs> and it had like 99% accuracy. Mm. But it was completely useless. Yeah, but we wouldn't see that. But or if you have if you have these kind of explainable mm-hmm. techniques, you would. Yeah. But if you don't, you can be fooled by having a really biased data set. So, it's so it's the whole for sure. Uh, how right? how to look into the black box, right? Yeah. We don't really need to look into the black box. We can ask the AI also to explain to us mm-hmm. why he's what, you know what's the core parameters he based it on. Like is, like we touched upon, how do we get people to study uh, engineering? Mm-hmm. I mean. We, we, I started in hardcore science, like studying too much, doing too much research. But now that we're applying it, it's also very interesting to do uh, research applied to a certain problem. Mm. For example, if we look at our virus particles, we look, are they empty or full? Mm. But what about all the intermediate forms? Right. That's also interesting. Mm. So if our customer, if they ask us that question, we will try to figure out. Mm. And, and that's a very challenging question. That's where the artificial intelligence comes in. We, we are a little bit challenge. biased. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because it's like AlphaGo, you know, or, you know, AlphaZero and these kind of uh, recent models that mm. learn us how to play chess or Go or these kind of other games. And when they surpass human level in, you know, performance for mm. all these games, you start to have them becoming a teacher for you as a human because they find patterns that humans haven't found before and they find ways to play the game that you couldn't think of or didn't even know about. And perhaps you can do that, you know, f- for your use case as well, 
where an AI suddenly finds some kind of pattern, uh, <coughs> if it's broken or not, I, I'm not sure about your domain because I have no understanding of but that. But human error can be a good thing in research. If you forget a sandwich and you have fungus work uh, growing <laughs> on it, <laughs> so you can true. get penicillin. <laughs> but when true. a computer does something wrong, then it's something wrong yeah, with the compilation and the testers. You will blame something else. So, so yes. human error or creativity, we always try to cheat a little bit, yes. but that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah indeed. Mm. So I don't know where to go next because I think we, we started off on some big topics that we can circle back on, uh, or we, you know, now we've gone down a little bit, the, the, the tech rabbit hole. Do we want to continue that in, in yes, a little bit more? Some way to finish up, you know, you have built a company uh, mm -hmm. since yeah. 2005, right? Yeah. And you are today over 100, more, how big are you? 100 yeah, employees? 140. 14 yeah. people, so. But let's talk about the composition of those 140 people. Mm, Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. We, we, we jump <laughs> on each other. Sorry, man. Great. Go first. So for people that want to know, you know, I want to build a company as well, uh, mm. similar to yours perhaps, or in some other field, but to actually be managing to, to build a company to, to the success that you have today. Can you just share perhaps some advice of mistakes you made or, you know, something that you really uh, love about, you know, this I did really well, causing me to have the success I have today? Mm. It's basically one thing. It's about recruiting the right people. Yes. So good recruitments and bad recruitments. That summarizes all. And now you just have to tell us, how do you recruit <laughs> the right people? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a challenge, actually. Yeah. So we, we started out more like a group of friends. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always call them my family, but well, and I, th I still think so. Uh, if, if you're passionate about something and you like what you do, that just makes things a little bit easier. So we yeah. started with a bunch of people with scientific background, basically researchers, uh, trying to solve a problem that was a, a problem that we needed to solve to make our lives easier. Like I said, it was a very egoistic thing, having data in, from the, in the form of images and not being able to convince someone that this is what I see, this is correct, do you see it? And they say, no. And another fascinating thing is to work interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. okay, having so, the right mix of competences. Yeah, I, I think that that's the, the key to success here, to be able to communicate between sciences, like I'm a chemist, but personal chemistry, mm. that's the most important thing. So I was like, I, I came from chemistry, I went into biology, which is more complex. So if you go to chemistry and like physical chemistry, that's mathematics, very logical. And then you go to biology, which is very complex, many variables at the same time. And medicine, where you try to apply it, try to solve some problems. So we worked in the interface between technology and medicine using very, very advanced equipment, <laughs> electron microscope, expensive, complicated that we needed to automate and things. And then we had the actual problem to solve, but we managed to communicate and collaborate. But okay, let me ask a very concrete question. How do you do um, recruitment interviews? I actually don't do them anymore. <laughs> I only recruit How the management team. In the, in the, okay. Oh, I, I, I uh, sorry to oh, say sorry. this, but I That's... recruited friends. You're sitting next to Mats here. No, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 uh, I can go back three years. That, that's yeah. the timeline that I have back here. And then this actually goes back to, if we go to 2005 and 2015 and so forth, there wasn't the, the great divide between that many departments that it's still growing, of course, mm -hmm. as we are... Mm -hmm commercializing more and more of our services and yeah. also products or solutions. So that means that we have more skill sets that we need to acquire and retain within Varunova. That means also we need an HR department, which probably wasn't needed 2010. I don't know how many we were at 2010, but now we are over 100. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different organizational challenges that just touches this question. Mm -hmm. How do you perform interviews? They are, of course, different if you do them in an ARR research and innovation center, yes. what, where you might need to do concrete cases for the people that you uh, try to hire. If we go to the sales and marketing department, you have other skill sets that you need to align with. So that's actually something that we have built up the last three years. Oh, there. Yes, to see. Of course, there was a process for it before, but to structure that, to be able to scale up as mm -hmm. we are a scale up company, that means that we need to do interviews in a processed way mm -hmm. with the search, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And if we qualify the people, we have a okay, we have a candidate that we need to take yes. in many cases from a different country. What kind of pre-boarding acti- activities do we have for that person coming from India? Mm. So they get integrated and get help with all the administrative work that we talked about before. How do we onboard them fast when they come to Bionova, where we have a diversity of different knowledge, skill sets in different, not silos, but departments within Bionova. So they ramp up fast and create business value for Bionova within three or six months, or I would guess like in one week would be super great, but we all know that organizational change takes time and onboarding is just one of those parameters that we need. Okay, yeah, onboarding for sure, it's, it's hard, but, but still you have to make a decision of this is the person I want. And let's say you have a team, uh, develop the hardware or some part of the software, or I don't know, some part of the chemistry or the medicine that you want to do. No, in the beginning, yeah. it's, it was expertise, mm-hmm. like knowledge. Yeah. That yeah. was the foundation for recruiting. Not that much people. engineering. Well, mm-hmm. best of the best. Like yeah. you need some really, really clever pro- people <laughs> to yes. solve some really, really complex problems. So that, that's all PhDs. Or we have two professors, yeah. professor in chemistry, medicine. We had one in mathematics. Mm-hmm. A lot of PhDs. So yes. people who were working on this in an academic research setting. That, that was a starting point. And if you go from 2005 when we founded the company until 2015, it was basically a research organization funded with grants, like 200 million crowns in grants, right. developing the technology, developing uh, drugs against influenza virus. Mm. No venture capitalist would have founded that. Like if someone Are comes- you sure? <laughs> yeah, not in Sweden. <laughs> well, we have a, a lot of good funding from uh, entrepreneurs yeah. who have built companies themselves. They have a really, really good understanding. If you go through a due diligence with the VC or PE, people think that's complicated. No. Mm. If you have an entrepreneur who have built a company, they ask the right questions Mm. like you are. Mm. How did you recruit people? How do you recruit people? Mm. Who are in your management team? How are you recruiting people? These are very, very important things. How you build your organization. How many teams are functional? (laughs) If you have a team with five people and suddenly they're 20, it causes a lot of friction. Mm. Of course. And and not everybody can be a manager having employees. Right. And some researchers, you have to lock them into a room sometimes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they really like that. Yeah, we, Don't we have disturb the maturity, them. Maturity levels of the different yeah. departments, of, of course. Really challenging. But, but yeah. What I would say for, for the recruitment process is that we, of course, have different stages in mm. the interviews. And if you have cases and bringing up different persons to meet, to meet with the actual person to see both to check out what the values are for the person, what's the ability to learn past, and then the skill sets that are different from the different departments. Mm. So that's Ray Dalio stuff, of course, if you hear ability, uh, values, and skill sets, but that's pretty much- Personality is very, very important. Generalize around it. I have one question. Uh, Having built a company up till 100 people, I think you mentioned something which is very good because when you start a company, usually, uh, you invite people that you feel uh, trust with or you yeah. know people that you know that they know the business and et cetera. So you start, right? And then at some point of time, there is a number when the threshold becomes like, oh shit, now we are a company. I need to hire management to actually deal with this, all of these things. Yep. What was the number for you? No, a group of 20 exactly. is quite okay. Good. Thank you. To Definitely. be a manager. Yeah. But then, for example, now we have a quite big management team, like 10 people. And we also have subsidiaries, or in Swedish we say daughter companies, with CEOs running it and so on. So if you acquire a company and you have a group of people who are good at working together, let them be. (laughs) We try to integrate them. We had a a cowboy and Indian party, but it it doesn't work. You know, let the people who know each other as a team work as a team. And then you just take the manager and let the manager work with the management team. And, and this like, is complicated. Yeah. This yeah. is complicated. Because it's very, very easy to lose what called company culture. Yes. If you have a chemist and a computer scientist, they don't understand each other. But do they have to? No. But they want to. So it's if they want to, give them beer and food and let them talk. <laughs> but don't force it upon them. You know, I don't want to know what the chemical formula for that is. I don't give a shit. But, but, but we have you. Great. You know that. Wow. I'm proud of you. 
But I, now, now, we, now we're going into some of the core topics, which is, uh, I mean, like, given what you got awards f- from, but mm. one of the core super cool things with Veronova, and we're already touching upon it a little bit, is that you essentially, as a core business model or business idea, are, you're dealing with intersectional innovation. So yep. you're dealing with data and data science, computer software mm. innovation, together with what did you say? Me- tech and medicine. Tech, tech and medicine. For sure. So hardcore, uh, if if you want to extrapolate, what, what is the core AI transformation all about is about mm. infusing AI and data and software in any business domain. And here we have a core business model where you are basically living the dream, you know, living the yeah. dream of what Scania wants to do or what Vattenfall wants to do in order to get data driven, right? So how the hell do you get that lingo to work? You know, between, I, use, I, I usually joke, how do you get people that speak Python and people that speak Latin to find their common ground? How, how? Quite, quite easy, actually. If you have very, very intelligent people. I thought we would say beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's very easy to get yeah. beer. Yeah, well, that, that helps us. Don't, don't spoil it now. <laughs> That's but secret. if you have very, very intelligent people, they, they usually know that they are intelligent. Yeah. But the best intelligent people are the ones who don't tell you that they are very intelligent. Yes. Good. Well they quite, I would say, uh, mute. Yes, really. humble. Yeah, they're humble, humble. and they're cur- very humble. And still curious, maybe. Curious. And want, and want so to learn about the don't take away the curiosity. Don't tell an intelligent people how to do this, like step one, step oh, two, yes. step three. If you do that, you take away all the fun thing. But it's also very, very difficult as a manager. That if you're going to that. tell them, can you go and paint that uh, red? No, no, no. It's like, do we need to paint that? And then you go away. <laughs> <laughs> but and then have- they will not only paint that, they will rebuild it and make it nice. And yeah. they will offer you beer yeah. to show you what they have painted. But, but so, so one of the management techniques is actually not to connect all the dots. Exactly. Is actually to leave the question f- frame, you know, so create so management style, maybe, I don't know. I think it tell- that's the benefit Coaching. of, Coaching. you know, you have to admit to yourself that I'm good at this. I'm bad at that. And when you acknowledge that, then you want to hire, okay, shit, I'm bad at this. I need to hire someone who's much better than me on that. Yes. And when you hire that person, Let give them, them the responsibility. Yeah. yeah, You can learn from them. But for example, if you have a, a good management team, if you throw in a question, I can have a solution or I believe I have a solution to it. But if I ask my management team and I listen to all the 10 different, it actually becomes like 10 times better. Yeah, but let's 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 go nerdy on the mechanics mm-hmm. of getting uh, someone with with a medical background and someone with the actual uh, you know computer science background. How do they work? What what is the lingo? You know, in uh, hardcore down, how have they found their pace as a team? How does that work? I, I think it's quite uh, also it's quite easy. Medicine is complex, many mm-hmm. variables, many problems. And engineers, they like to solve problems. Mm. So if you have the the ones with the complicated problems asking the engineer to solve it, that's good enough. So then they, that's they, how we work. It's actually. a little bit like you get them, uh, they play well together. L- l- let's bring this in as kids in the candy store, having fun playing with toys. And they, yeah. they, 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 they have something to, basically the, the, the problem becomes the common denominator where we, we can find- Problem solving. Yeah. Problem solving Someone is- Someone has got a problem. Someone has got a solution. In, in our case, for example, I was looking at these images, at viruses. So the image analysis toolbox, that's a little bit easier. They have some tools. Mm. Okay. Then it's about finding the right tool. But then in mathematics, you can develop new tools or you can modify the tool to make it better to your application. So that's basically how we did it. I had a problem. I needed to solve it. I asked people working with image analysis. I, work, I asked people working with mathematics. And together... We solve the problem. But uh, actually, th- to make it real simple, we take the Swedish citat, um, lika barn leker bäst, men olika barn uh, hittar på de bästa lekarna. Together. Ah, that's a it's a little bit, if we're going to take it Can in Can you say that in English? Uh, equal Have fun chill. at work. Equal f- child play game. well, <laughs> yes. but different children comes Great. up with the ga- best games. Yes. Mm. That's a good one. But it's, it's difficult. That's a good thing with the um, software development. That's their own language. You don't have to speak Swedish or English. You're, you're doing coding. You're coding. It's the same with mathematics. It's Unless numbers. you're Microsoft and you turn in the programming language <laughs> to Swedish, which is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. another question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But still, okay. So there are a number of like the, these kind of uh, ideas about, you know, how, how to keep 
the company as productive as possible and also happy as possible, which is actually, I, I would argue, like a sub-component of being productive. If you keep the people and the employees happy, then they will be productive as well. But do but the most intelligent people want to work with the most complicated problems. That's one thing. Yeah. And, and to keep motivation or passion for your work, you, you really need to, to have a real passion for your work. I mean, mm. I think it's easier for us. We're working with combating virus infections. That's a good cause. It is. Yeah. It's not uh, about making money. It's about curing disease, saving lives. But you must have a number of like boring tasks you have to do to, to actually, you know. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> counting <laughs> particles and whatnot, you know. Now you hopefully yeah. can automate that. But still, it's. Uh, th th I'm sure there are a number of boring tasks you still have to do. Yeah, but you have to share the success as well. Like yeah. even small successes. For example, if we... When we got the GMP certification the day after we celebrated with champagne and stuff like that, not everybody understood how big that is. How many years yeah. from different departments uh, like that had been 10, 15 years of work and then suddenly it happened. So it's the same with many companies. It's like 10, 15 years of hard work and then immediate success. It's not immediate success. It's not overnight success. It's a lot of hard work, but a lot, lot of people. Then there's also a lot of pride. If I worked like 10 years, uh, trying to build a microscope and then suddenly it works. Mm. That That's, how to say, a big ego. <laughs> Probably should move it into what GMP is, actually is. So <laughs> I think we said no, that a number of times. But it's just about the employees. If the employees can feel part of, you know, success, the success yeah. and, and they are. I mean, I cannot do anything anymore. It's it's all about the, the clever people that we have and how good they work together. Right. That's how you solve problems. And they should really be proud and happy about the things that they managed to do. Actually, actually I, I want to have, I want to have time. I, I want to switch gears a little bit because I want to have time to explore some of the awards that Verona, uh, Veronova has got, because I think they open up new, very interesting conversations. Mm. So you had the uh, Hitachi Transformation Award in 2019. And then you, you got the Life Science Star Award in uh, 2021. Show them. Yep. This is super cool stuff. You go over here. So which one should we start with? Because they open up different conversations, I think. <clears throat> they're they're really, really good conversation starters on different yeah. topics of success. This yeah. is I, I think continuing on people and diversity management. Yeah, I, I know that. Mm. So we should be starting that or, or should we okay, start? So, uh, the, so the Sweden bio, that's the organization. That was right it. recently, right? Yeah. That's the companies in the life science industry, like pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, med tech. So this, this is great. This week or, or September or something like this? Yeah, a month ago. A month ago. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the best price actually. Yeah. By peers, a prize from your peers telling you that we have the most talented people employed at Varinov. So what, what was the motivation or what is the category? What does it mean? So I think that it was, uh, that we were, um, this is an ego boast. N now yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm bad at bragging, but <laughs> yeah, but we can be able to sometimes. recruit the best of the best to a quite small company in a small country where it's cold and dark in November, <laughs> really, really talented people from all over the globe, actually. And I, I, I think we should mention also some of the really great students to come here to study or do their PhD that we managed to make them stay in Sweden, working with us, a small company and not even profitable yet. Uh, and, and making them work together. And it's not only about recruiting people. You asked about how do you hmm. recruit them is how do you keep, keep them? them yeah. Because if you recruit I mean, them and they don't like it, the they leave. I mean, that's what I mentioned in the beginning, yeah, you know, yeah. you can actually have really good people in Sweden, given the educational system we have, but you need mm -hmm. to keep them as well. And I remember from my Spotify that's days, different. you know, that's different. super, super tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to change. I mean, uh, if you look at being a research organization, developing a product, that's one thing. When you go through a commercial phase, when it's all sales, marketing, and like now communication, and it's totally different skill sets. And I think one of the benefits is we have a lot of, hardcore scientists who are really, really good at communicating. I think that's exceptional. That's, cool. that's exceptional because they're really, really good. We have, for example, in sales, we have a application specialist. I mean, the ones who are really the experts selling the, the product or the education. Once you buy the product or the solution from us, you have to explain how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. That's also a... I could go, really go on forever for this. Please like, ask. Just, <laughs> just to highlight application specialists. Uh, who are in the intersection between virology, knowing the software, 
mm. the AI applications of it or the deep learning aspects of it. And can do the storytelling yeah, for the whole thing. Do the storytelling in the pre-sales. Now we talk our language, pre-sales, and then on the onboarding when people has Get decided to we and, want and to be trained how yeah. to use it properly. So then it's onboarding training and then change management. Yes. And then they are also involved with the customer success. How do we retain our customers if we have a SaaS model yeah. and want to have a re recurring revenue model for our software? So it's impossible without these geniuses. So of course they came come from an um, academic background, but they are working in a commercial sense. And then of course we have other commercial people working with core sales. That's not easy at all. So the diversity of our different teams that's the yeah. key. We, I can just so let's let's, let's get into this because the way I understood when I read the the jury's uh, recognition here, and the way I I, I remember I did a LinkedIn post mm. and I was like and I, and I remember it's like goosebump mo moment mm. because we talk about diversity and we talk about the challenges in 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 Sweden of getting talent in, and here one company is getting it done, man. This is the way I read that you are getting it done. You are getting through the red tape. You're getting the talent in, and you're you you're creating a diversified company with all different nationalities in Sweden. And I think it's used kick ass. So yeah, well, why don't we I use go diversity nuts is on not topic. the color of your skin, <laughs> first no? of all. So we didn't think about this. No. So we have uh, Max talking about artificial intelligence. This yeah. is for you, Max Pilstrom, a genius. <laughs> uh, he's young, very young. Like 23, yeah, 24. Yeah, this is I think he's got a mustache, but yeah, I haven't he's checked. He's a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, and then we have a professor, Jan Berman, 80. Yeah, this so is that's diversity. diversity. Having someone who's Hallelujah. 80 years old working at the company. He was kicked out of the university when he turned 67. We built a lab for him. <laughs> he's like a grandfather of Vironova. Oh, and so he's cool. a genius. And, you know, he's calm. He's experienced. That's a good thing. But then they have the young trying out the new things, but mentorship is really, really great. So you have diversity in age nationalities. Yes. We didn't think about that. It's just the fact that 50% of the PhDs are international uh, students. I, I, I can okay. put numbers Let's on that. Let's recruit so, the best. Well, I can yeah. put numbers on that. Yeah. One. Okay. 36% Please. of our employees are PhD mm. degrees. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the hardcore. average age of a Vironovian is 43 years old. Mm. And we, the span is from a little bit over 20 years old and plus 80 with John Berman. Mm. And then we had 22 different nationalities. That doesn't mean like the ethnicity of it. It's that but, the people have different backgrounds, but, experiences that contribute to the boiling template that we have. That I, I can't shut up more. Education you are my heroes background. because yeah. you are talking about diversity in the real sense and not yeah. in terms of some political game of what we are trying to, you know, Mm. I don't know. You know what, what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah d uh, definitely. I'm, I'm so the way you're talking about, myself, about the way you're talking about diversity is also an educational is, background. Yes, uh, as yeah. we talk, like working interdisciplinary, yes. having uh, scientists and commercial people working together. That's also diversity. And, and like Mas touched upon, for uh, our sales, it used to be I call it lab coat selling an expert selling to an expert. But then if you're selling an equipment that costs you 7.5 million crowns, you have to type, talk to the guy in the suit. And I'm sorry to say it's a guy in the suit, but you know, yeah. real work. You have a suit yourself. And that's so another, <laughs> yeah. But that's another aspect of diversity. If you look at our management team, you know, mm. the future is, 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 is not a man's world anymore. <laughs> that's history. That's the sixties in the music. The women today are the ones who are studying who are well-educated and they're hardworking. Uh, yeah, and we could loop, loop from here to go from mm. the diversity and the need of that to our different business models. We have complex yeah. solutions or sales that we, we yeah. that's our common now, now we come back to our background. Not transactional, but tra traditional selling. When we talk about our <laughs> services to a large amount of different companies all around the world. So your portfolio of your business model is actually from quite complex type business you're doing. I mean, like a, a longer sales cycle yeah. to something which is quite, you know, a service, a yes, subscription. Exactly. And the service doesn't need us to talk to the business suit. Mm -hmm. So it's transact not transactional, traditional. Mm -hmm. We have complex sales where multiple stakeholders, yeah. they are in suits and lab coats and it's procurement and it's, uh, you know, it's hurdles. So that, that's a challenge actually to, to have a, uh, like we started in software, 
<clears throat> and then we integrated the software with the hardware. Mm. Then we built hardware. So investors, for example, they like you to be a software company with a SaaS model, <laughs> uh, margin, profit. So we actually, we are, we're, now we're a service company, but we sit on our own software and hardware and we are the experts of using it. And we also have the, the regulatory certification, the GMP and GLP that you talked about. Let's go, let's go there. So. <laughs> yeah. So now we're a service company, but the complexity is, you know, everybody wants to put a, a brand on you. Yes. Yeah. Pigeonhole you in, in yeah, are you exactly. doing this yeah. sale or this sale or this product? We don't accept that. Love we are Vironova. <laughs> this is what we do. This is your problem. This is how we solve it. It's a solution. How we solve it, not your problem. But We're solving it for you. You say you're a service company then. Yep. Can, can, perhaps right you can now. elaborate a bit more. What is the business model of Vironova? It's actually a service, as I said. So we have developed our own microscope that is user-friendly, automated, that so you don't sell it, you rent it or what? Before the pandemic, yes. But what happened now, the last two years with the travel restrictions and so on, we were, we, yeah, we started, we actually, first we built the Minitem, a small desktop version of an Electromyce. So we had a problem with the scalability there. So we partnered with, there are only three companies in the world producing electron microscopes, mm -hmm. two are Japanese. And one is uh, American, former Dutch Philips, now at part of Thermo Fisher and Hitachi and Geol in Japan. So in order to get the scalability, we partnered with Hitachi. They invested in the company. We put our software on their machine mm -hmm. called ViroTem, specifically made to look at viruses. And that sounds like a great thing in 2020 when we launched the product, <laughs> but we couldn't reach out to our customers and install it because we were prevented and Swedish people were not allowed to come to anyone yeah. <laughs> at this time. So we, we launched the, the product beginning of 2020. We, we uh, installed and sold one in Japan at the university. We sold another one. We haven't installed it yet. Uh, that was the scalability. Hitachi can produce 100 per year. The mini time we could produce like 10, but suddenly we couldn't sell microscopes. So, but you could still send samples. So what the pharmaceutical companies they actually like that model more because it's more comfortable for them. All of a sudden you, all, you pivoted to another completely different We business. had to, it was just survival. So let so you're going, instead of putting the equipment in their facilities mm. as a service, they send the samples to you and now you can do it as a service even. Yes. And, and when, but you know, uh, you know, Ingmar Stenmark, luck comes to the well-prepared. Yeah. So we were very lucky because we were prepared. And, and the thing was, we got this GMP certification of our lab, uh, 31st of January, 2020. Perfect. Yeah. That. So, and now what is GMP in this nutshell? Because I think GMP now very good. helps you to f have the trust for this service model to work. Exactly. So, so if you look at the life science industry, one of the issues is the, all the regulatory framework that mm. you have to uh, work according to. Mm. And, and as I said, it's all about patient safety. Mm -hmm. So we, we have like one lab with a GLP certification and the electron microscopy lab is a GMP. Good Which manufacturing the, practice. The one in the world. The only one in the world. Yeah. And, and meaning the only one in the world is that the, the, the um, analysis of the data that we have generated is according to GMP, meaning well-educated people, calibrated instruments, et cetera, et cetera. So GMP is a, a certification standard. <clears throat> yeah. So okay. it means that the, the pharmaceutical companies, once we have done the quality control of their vaccines, they can use that data towards the FDA. Directly. Get, yeah. To get approval to produce uh, and sell their product. So, so, th so did the difference in FDA processing steps, boom, you just took away a whole step by coming out GMP certified straight out of what yeah, you've done. Yeah, you can invest in the company. You're... I get it. I get it. <laughs> we take that after. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's, it's really important. It's a big step because we're talking about science here and, and basic research. That's a very uh, open-minded, creative uh, atmosphere. Working according to GMP, GMP or GLP, that's, that's strict. And this is ultimately, and, and you have FDA in, in the States and mm -hmm. what is the equivalent in Europe? EMA. Yeah. And which one is tougher? No, Sweden is a good country because the Swedish, uh, FDA, so to speak, you know, Sweden is, is like a court system. Uh, many international conflicts wow. take place in Sweden because we are a democracy and we're knowledgeable and the, the legal system is trustworthy. Yep. It's the same with the Swedish FDA and the fact that we had, we have AstraZeneca, we had Pharmacia, so we have a lot of knowledge about this. So being a Swedish company, 
is a good brand. Yeah, and, and it's also if you take EMA and FDA, they're harmonized in a legal way when you look at the quality aspects of it. So an FDA stamp is should be the same stamp as yeah. an EMA or LAC middle market yeah. uh, qualification. I, I need to I need to admit uh, I, I'm a little bit um, indoctrinated to all these challenges, and and I saw my mom getting gray hair faster than normal. She worked as the medical director for Makia working with these processes. Yep. yep. So my key is doing uh, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a lot of anesthesia paperwork. stuff. Yeah. Mm. Uh, also respirator. Yeah. A lot of shit, a lot of work. Yeah. And then audits and audits and audits and yeah. all this. And that's mm. in, in a clinical environment with, with med, med tech, um, med tech equipment. In cl- clinical. So, but it's, I don't know, it, this is a different, if you're not into this world of med tech and this, yeah. it's, it's, you know, the trial one, two, three, all this stuff, it, it's, what do you say? Ten years yeah. process, yeah. and it uh, is not driven by it's driven by regulations, literally. But the interesting thing here is uh, knowledge about software and mm-hmm. also about combining software and hardware. What we've been fascinating about is that some companies are like pure hard um, hardware companies. Yeah. They don't do right. software. They're exactly. like there's a they're a hardware company, and they don't even do services. Basically, services installation and you know changing oil and filter. <laughs> But combining that, now the industry is like integration of software with hardware. That's where everything is happening. Yeah, but but let's go here now. Then where, where is the whole med tech med, medical industry going? Because I mean, like clearly, I can go to Ericsson and I can see the radio base station was seventy five percent hardware. Mm-hmm. Now it's not even twenty percent hardware. And when we got get into five G, is you know uh, you know fifty percent algorithms and then software. You know, so it's compl- the, the whole world turning from hardware to software or hardware sell mm-hmm. as part of the software. Yeah, I, I I see this as a major disruption in the med tech industry where we have some laggards who hasn't figured this out yet. Yes, Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. And then we talked about the FDA and the EMEA. They and do they really, understand this? They have been really good. Okay. Fast at adopting, uh, you know, allowing med tech devices that are like software devices, basically on a piece of hardware, mm-hmm. measuring your heart rate, heartbeat, yeah, and my insulin. Case, this is my exactly. Yeah. So it's really yeah. interesting how fast they have approved uh, some gadgets. Um, because I, I was going to ask that if the FDA and the regulatory bodies has kept up with the AI and software uh, transformation of the world. And they, in some ways, I think they I, have. I think they have. It's a very, very conservative, uh, tough regulatory environment. But actually, one of our obstacles or, or, or for our comp- uh, customers is uh, when it comes to gene therapy, for example, there are still some you know, regulatory things that need to be in place that are not there yet. Yeah. Like setting a threshold. If you work with artificial intelligence or or software, you usually want to know as an engineer, like what's good enough. Is it 75%? Is it 85%? Or, (laughs) and, uh, that's, that's a challenge for our customers. They don't know, or or they don't have a, a law to follow or a regulatory framework to follow with some of the variables. Because yeah, sorry, go. So you don't have a, like a Tesla moment when, you know, Tesla tried, tried to launch in Sweden and, you know, they have a um, continuous update of their software in the cars mm. and they have to be certified to, to drive on the roads in Sweden and then basically have to get recertified for every update, which happens every week. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So that was a big problem. And mm. basically the uh, regulatory bodies was not, was not prepared for that. Would you say the, the, um, the Swedish FDA is better equipped to, to handle this or? But it's true. You cannot just do a software update without knowing if that software update is good. You have to certify it because every, it's, every it's about safety. This is the same as the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, driving a car is not only about you, it's about everybody else driving a car. And you as a driver on the road, you want to make sure that the other ones, even if you're not driving a Tesla, mm-hmm. that, that, that the car is functional. Yeah. That's one of the complexities here yeah. with, with software AI in, yeah. in, in this environment. So yeah. updates or upgrades, re- new releases and so forth, software, mm-hmm. AI or non-AI enabled, it's for the customer when they have a process, they don't want to change that process because mm. of the regulatory bodies. Yes. Yeah. So costly. Yeah, costly. So if you have some functional um, process that you know is working, you don't want to change that. So the earlier we can get in into the clinical phase or in preclinical phases with our solutions, the better. 
So but, but don't you foresee the problem though, if you have to recertify like every time you do an update for the model that you are using? Or yeah, you if you go to something that? that is closer to, to your own life, mm. <laughs> like let's take a pacemaker. Yes. Would you be safe with having those live updates like of your pacemaker yes. without having them certified? Not without, but mm. I would like to have continuous update and yeah. I would like to have an automated pipeline certifying mm. that, you know, in, in normal software development, you have this mm. kind of concepts called CICD, continuous integration, continuous uh, development. Mm. And if it passed the test, the CI part, mm. it should be directly deployed. And I wish you could have like a CI for certification. Yeah. Like an automated process that... Yeah. Are we going in this direction? Is, no, is no, but now we're talking to someone who knows, who's knowledgeable about software. For me, for example, I, I know viruses, I know vaccines. I, I, can, I cannot understand anti-vaxxers, for example. <laughs> no. No, because they're not knowledgeable, but they get afraid. So if you, let's imagine someone else who's got a pacemaker who doesn't know anything about software. Mm. Do you think they would be comfortable with having automatic updates? No, I don't think so. Not I, without I, having the certification. Uh, so if you have an FDA that you trust and, and you know that they are doing the best they can to do it, then I would be. I but but, but aren't we, aren't we yeah. talking yeah. about something else? I, I agree. We need the certification, but we need them to have a relevant type of process around certification for the first you know, innovation versus the upgrades of the innovation. Yeah. This goes back to your where we, this discussion started about uh, it takes 10 years and costs a lot of money uh, to develop a drug. Why? Because of the regulatory system. You first have to test it on, on healthy individuals to make sure that it doesn't harm you. Mm. Uh, so it's easy to kill a virus, but it's difficult to do it without killing the patient. <laughs> that's for sure. So, <laughs> Which you, remember so you cannot give a drug. That's a tough one. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's not difficult to do a hardware update, but to, to, to be really safe about it. Yeah. And it's the same with the vaccine. You, you cannot give a vaccine that actually kills people. No, that's not a good idea. It's not allowed. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's so a you bad idea. <laughs> the problem is it takes such a long time and costs an awful a lot of money. But where it. do you see the trend here? I mean, like, because software and AI will become more and more pervasive in these types of technologies. Mm. How is FDA or how are you tackling that to get the speed up and, and, and all that? Or I think there's a fantastic future for artificial intelligence as a decision support and tester even. not not as a solution to all our problems i mean we're going to work on the climate change and cure more diseases and so it's going to be a fantastic decision support for people in many many uh, disciplines for example for a physician for a physician they need to meet a patient but simple things like measuring the temperature or the pulse or the heart rate that can be automated mm. and you can get all that data immediately yeah. and, and simple also, things yeah, it's yeah. also an industry that it's if we talk about gene yeah. cell therapy it's it's pretty young and novel so there's a lot of orthogonal methods around that and different certifications uh, around that so we're working to create the golden standard for that actually with transmission electron microscopy supported by our software it's just too high tech as you have heard <laughs> electron microscope that's most advanced hardware, you have the most advanced software, you have all these experts. But when we perform, when we try to solve problems, it goes fast, it's very accurate, and we can charge, uh, charge for it, mm. which makes it a business, not only research. So uh, I think the funny thing is the pace of how we can generate new uh, knowledge. It's amazing. It is amazing. It, it, it's, it's, it just goes faster and faster. The problem is, can we apply it to real problems? Yes. So we need more applied science probably. But and we know, need more companies that can actually, you know, certify the quality of the drugs like uh, Vironova, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it would be surprising to say no. Sparkle, Good point. Good. <laughs> there, it's a demand. No. Yeah. But, but if we move more into, I mean, it's only a quarter left you know, before yeah, we two we, hours. So. There, there's a couple of more Time topics. Uh, I mean, like you can start, I, 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 have, I have a couple of angles I would yes. like to explore, but if you want to take one first. Yeah, but then I'm going to move to some AI questions and, and just, you know, hear, you know, your thoughts about that. And, and one of the big revolutions that we've seen by DeepMind, for example, in, mm. in the medical field is the AlphaFold uh, model. And in short, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but I will try to explain what it does, which is trying to predict what the protein 3D structure is, given the, 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 the sequence that they have. 
and in that way try to understand the function of, of those proteins in a better way. Am I correct so far, or can so you just? This is hardcore Vironova. This is yes. where most of our employees <laughs> have their background. Yes. Yeah. But okay, so what the the AlphaFold thing did back in 2020 was um, they were able to predict this 3D structure, 3D structure using deep learning technologies and mm. these transformer-based models, EvoFormer and whatnot. It was called. Uh, but they went from a prediction score or this kind of GDP thing, uh, yeah, a distance score from around 40 and, and the top score is 100%. But they went from 40 uh, first to 60 with the first version and then over like 90 uh, in GDP, very close to 100. And, and they basically say that we, at 90, you basically have predicted the exact structure mm. that the protein has. And in that way can describe the functionality of the protein to an extent that is, uh, yeah, more or less perfect. Yep. That you can just, you know, understand what it means. What do you think of discoveries like this? Do you think that will have a big impact on, you know, drug discovery in general or? It does. It it has already. It's, it's all about seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. So to make 3d three dimensional uh, crystals of proteins, that's not uh, new, it's quite old. Um, but the thing is, when you crystallize a protein, it's not the native form of your protein. When the protein is in the body, it's in a solution right. or in a membrane. Mm-hmm. When you crystallize it, it's a physical shape and form. Like, mm-hmm. if you look, what's the shape of water? It's not the same as ice. Ice is a crystal form of water. Right. So the thing to, to really see the proteins in their native form, you have to use electron microscopy. Oh. So this is back to the oh, Nobel nice. Prize in 2018, cryo-electron microscopy, what we do. Right. So it's all about you freeze a, your sample, and then you look at the three-dimensional, uh, you know, you, you do, it's called a reconstruction. This is also hardcore mathematics and mm-hmm. software. You, you have a sample, then you tilt it 60 degrees that way, 60 degrees that way, and then you pile it all together, and you get a 3D model of your protein. Mm-hmm. And the resolution, that's like how good the magnification is it's, it's called it's called in measured in ongström a swedish yes. phenomenon time yeah, yeah, 10 exactly. up to the minus nine from Uppsala university <laughs> yeah. but but the thing is once if you have that shape then of your protein as yes. you as you mentioned what, how do you turn that knowledge into something that how can you apply it yeah so how they apply it in the in the pharmaceutical industry is try to dock if you have a small molecule you try to find out where should that small molecule bind mm. Going back to the icosahedron, did someone call and, and say how many? <laughs> how many do we have? Do we end? Yeah. <laughs> I had to reveal that before we end. Then. Yes. So, so that's where this three-dimensional structures come c- comes in. You, you have the building blocks, the proteins. You can try to dock and simulate. Does your pharmaceutical compound bind to it or not, or right. where should it bind? Yeah. And this ha- this has been done, but the problem is, this is a simulation. Mm. And that's good. It's good to simulate and try out. So, could, could you but you have to try it in a wet lab, yes. and you have to try it in animals, and you have to try it in healthy humans, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And that makes a lot of sense. So, so would it be accurate to say a stem- statement like this? <clears throat> you could use simulation or this kind of predictions that AlphaFold can make to try to find a potential protein uh, or some drug that you believe had the right characteris- characteristics or properties that, that you're looking for. And then when you find like, okay, top three candidates for this, then you can do the proper test using, for example, Virinova. And and this is a much cheaper way and much faster way to do a screening. Yes, exactly. But it's not sure that it works, as I said, because that's the crystal form of your protein and it's not the native form, Mm. but it works as a simulation tool to try to find. you have drastically reduced the time for a big portion of the pre-work. And then when you do the wet lab work, which is quite tedious sure. and expensive you are starting from mm. best best possible um samples for the big efficiency go- yes effectiveness yeah. that's what you're after yeah. it might not be the right choice but mm. efficiency- yeah, but you, you went from 10,000 samples yes. down to 10 mm. Mm. that has so if you if you take this as an example many big pharmaceutical companies have set up big screening labs like this testing thousands and thousands of molecules for their targets and and if, but we have a Swedish professor, Arvid Karlsson. He won the Nobel Prize by saying it's just a waste of time and money because you have to try it in real life, like mouse model or on humans. 
to, mm. because it's, it's, I told you, it's easy to kill a virus, but can you keep the patient alive? <laughs> That's the problem. So with the screening, you can kill the virus, mm. but can you do it keeping the patient alive? And this is the hurdle. And then we come back to updates and, and regulatory aspects. But and you don't see any value in doing the simulation first? Yes, okay. definitely. And it's not only about looking at uh, proteins. Proteins are building blocks of bi bigger things. For example, at Vironova, many of us, we work with three-dimensional reconstructions of virus particles. Mm -hmm. That's how we find, found out that the capsid is an icosa heater. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can see a membrane. Maybe you can see what proteins are in the membrane. And that's the protein that we should put into the mRNA vaccine because nice. it's on the surface, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really, it's used already. Yeah. It's fantastic. And it gives a lot of understanding. And just by see seeing is believing, it gives a lot of understanding about what you're working with. Mm -hmm. It's, it's but, very but it's, valuable. It, but though. it's back to where do you use the AI and where do you use the sort of the human or the wet lab, so mm -hmm. to speak. The, 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 so how, how to get, we call it the, augmented intelligence, uh, you know. Yeah, but still, I think they are used in, in different phases here. So yes. first it, it's used for doing the simulation and finding candidates. Yes. And then you use AI as well. Yeah. Yes. In, in a more of a, you know, proper wet lab kind of control con or quality control. Right? Yeah, we have a very specific application. It's only one part of AI. I mean, deep learning, neural networks mm -hmm. and image analysis. Then yes. there are many, many other forms. So what we see in, in the, the pharmaceutical industry, if you look at the big giants and what they're doing, mm -hmm. They're, they're doing more patient registries, right. big data sets that are common Trial knowledge. one, two, three type stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. But these most advanced things that we're talking about, that's more simulation. Mm -hmm. So I think you you probably have much better examples than about no, but, how, but, how AI have been But ultimately to. AI becomes pervasive. And if you understand the core problem and what mm -hmm. data can do, you can apply it here is in the simulation perspective. Yep. Here is in the quality uh, assurance perspective. Mm -hmm. And here we have it in the trial perspective. And yep. all of a sudden we are, we are actually proving from one, uh, core domain, how AI becomes pervasive. Yep. And it's not like someone sits on the high fly and do an end to an AI. No, it's a narrow AI problem here. It's another one here. And it's a mm -hmm. third one here. And they're all, and if, and you know, the compounding effect yep. of how AI is then improving the end to end value chain yes. is absolutely massive. I think what's really interesting is artificial intelligence that is unbiased. I mean, <laughs> uh -huh. when we <laughs> haven't told there. them what's true or false, if we gave them the, if we give them the data, feed the data and the AI tells us what's in it, that that's really, really interesting. And I think a lot is going to come out of that because Humans, we try to cheat and we do errors and things. And computer science is really about feeding the computer with what it's they so should do. Yeah. That way. But what's interesting is to see the other way around. You can <laughs> yeah, give this, a data set mm. and let This the is the whole topic you. of, you know, ethical AI. And we put mm. harder, you know, with, oh, this is bias, this is bias. Come on. What yeah. is really bias is the human physical yeah. process. I have to also give a short uh, But who's right and who's here. wrong? I don't know. I don't no, know. But unfortunately, no, I'm, I'm also reviewing a bit of a regulation coming up in EU, et cetera, from mm. the upcoming AI Act, et cetera. And uh, there is one statement that says, if you want to use a data set for AI, it has to be completely error free and unbiased. So you're explaining why we don't have any tech giants in Europe. <laughs> GDPR. No, but, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it, it, it's horror. Yeah, it, it's just beyond belief in my view how, how they can even write that. Mm. But also, bias can be. I, I think you know, bias is not always bad. I, I must. Mm. And what I mean with this is, the right type of bias is really important. And then there are bad biases. So, I mean, an AI algorithm, if you have a data set without any biases, it will be completely random. Hmm. But then if you have this kind of subjective biases that comes outside of data set, which humans has, because they use, you know, knowledge from other reasons that is not really connected to the problem you're trying to look at, that's problematic, that's subjective. So, I mean, sure. the, the term bias here is a bit uh, ambiguous, you know, yeah. some, some bias is good. 
other biases. Yeah, we generally talk about bias as something bad. I mean, like in, yeah. all, in all our conversations and you are trying to highlight that. Well, you can also highlight that uh, bias is the reasoning or the, or the bigger intellect of, of, you know, the general intelligence of human yeah. directing the algorithm in a certain way. I mean, sometimes a gender bias is actually a good thing because it's really, you know, it's useful information, but it has to be related to the problem at hand. Mm. If it's We're coming to very philosophical questions here, yeah. what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and exactly. It's very no, but challenging. I think, you know, you, you need to keep it objective. You yeah. know? If you but there are many other drivers. I mean, the technical development, like storage of data, computer power. There are so many other drivers. So, mm. and that's the nice thing with uh, fundamental research or basic research. Mm. You don't know what the next, next big thing is. Yeah. So that's, that's why we do basic research because it's, it's not random, but a little bit random. Yeah. We really don't know today what's going to help us tomorrow. Yeah. So knowledge in any form is good. Technical development in any form is good. All kind of knowledge can be misused. <laughs> I mean, yes, exactly. You no know, physics, you can make a uh, nuclear weapon, but mm. it can also be used as an energy source. Yeah. So, I want to go into one uh, just uh, maybe a conf from a completely different angle, a, l a last topic uh, before we start doing the rounding off questions. And I just want to take the opportunity. So here we sit with Veronova, uh, um, a scale up company in that is truly core business part of the in intersection of innovation between data, AI software and, and, and a medical domain. And one of the things I think is important is, you know, how do we get the mid sized companies of Sweden part of the data and AI software journey? Yeah. We have the tech giants over here and we, we see the industry giants in, 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 in Europe. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get their stuff done. And I'm talking Scania, Vattenfall and all that. How should a mid-sized company think about all this? Should they sort of sit on the sidelines? Should they get in on the game? What What is your tip and advice? You are living the dream, uh, you know, in my opinion, of, of the yeah. of the future scale up. But what about the mid-sized companies who has who has still there as part of a core domain? They're a hard working. You know, yeah. What should they do? Well, how should they think? So, first, it's all about entrepreneurship. Mm. So, if you have a company and you start a company, you must have some a really, really strong driving force behind it. Mm -hmm. Who's uh, it's like Rocky Balboa. It's, it's about <laughs> how many hard hits you can take, not how many you can give, yeah. because it's a challenge, especially to, you know, commercializing something, finding a business model. And the problem is usually raising funds. Mm -hmm. So this question about having Swedish unicorns or big tech mm -hmm. companies in Europe is one thing is about funding mm -hmm. and funding is not as good in Sweden when it comes to the bigger amounts of money as in, for example, in the U S right. but when it comes to funding for startups, we're world leading mm. for sure. And there's a lot of, uh, soft money, as we said, like grants to test things out, yeah. make a prototype. What we're good, what we're bad at is the scale up. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. This so scale up can be either money like investments. And I think, unfortunately in Sweden, we go to the stock exchange a little bit too early with small and medium sized companies. And that kills many of them. They become like dead fish there because there's no liquidity, they don't raise more capital and they have to work with investor relations rather than with sales and marketing and, and product development. Core product development. Yeah. I think one, one, one way we've used it is partnership. So we're a small company in Sweden and our main market is, uh, well, it's Europe, US, but when one of our customers was bought by, acquired by a Japanese company, Takeda, mm -hmm. then we partnered with Hitachi and it's the third biggest market for us is Japan. It's a challenge as a small Swedish company to to conquer Japan. Mm. You know the the song. But maybe Hitachi is a good idea. Song not lost in Japan, but yeah, something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so so to par partner. I I know Alpha will yeah, big, yeah, big, big, big in Japan. Yeah, big in Japan. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think it's the rum or the beer. <laughs> something for the we're gonna start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're gonna, gonna start to speaking Japanese Japan. soon. But I think <laughs> partnership is one model. Yeah, yeah. Collaboration, yeah, collaboration, because I think business is also uh, all about sharing. Uh, like we said, mm, recruiting people is about mm. sharing success. When it comes to business is about sharing revenues with your shareholders mm. or your partners. It's much easier to do business together. A win-win is better than lose-lose. And it's the same. If you're a small Swedish company and you want to enter and become big in Japan, partnership is a good thing. Either an investor, investor or a company, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, one big benefit with Sweden is uh, all the big companies with a lot of senior management that have uh, experience, they work uh, internationally, 
they are the best investors in Sweden, actually, besides the entrepreneurs that have the cash. So go, and the go close to one of the big Swedish giants. Partnership with the Swedish big companies and Swedish big companies want to partner with small Swedish companies, but uh, that's like mm. working it interdisciplinary. <laughs> it's not <laughs> the same language, no. <laughs> like uh, science and business. Big company, you know, Corporate. processes, yeah, corporates, routines, Corporate versus, yeah. SMEs, that's more innovation, flexible. It's not the same thing. Mm. Yeah. We're fast, they're slow. Yeah. And they want to be fast. So in, in a way that they dream about this and you mm. dream about that. So, so they in have theory, the resources, they have the money. They it should be a good senior fit. management. It's, it's a great fit. But I what think. is the problem? The problem is the lingo and, and it's, uh, you know, in, in this partnership, why doesn't it happen more? Uh, the, the, it's all about entrepreneurship, grit mm. and stamina. Mm. If you want to do something, it's uh, what's, what do you usually say? It's all in the execution, Mats. Yeah, no, yeah. no, it, it, it's all in the, this, you know, this. The doer. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. no, but you know this, um, Henrik, it's the strategy to execution gap. Yeah. How do we, Thank you. how do we diminish that gap? Yeah. And uh -huh. it's about endurance. Let's go from say, uh, slideware to hardware. Yeah. yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. To yeah. Execution. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. <laughs> execution is strategy and vice versa. No one of those uh, Management different, consultants. Uh, no, no, but they coexist and no one goes before the other one. They are equally important. That's one thing. Mm. And then I would say also we, on a greater level in Sweden, if we want to talk Sweden, that we, if we don't have the endurance to let some of these companies in the scale up mode to have the endurance and they go under the quarterly economy yeah. where they need to show up mm. with red or black figures, uh, every figures month. with expectation management. Yeah. Um, What's the figures? quote here? It's, it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, right? Yes. Yeah. You have to have the stamina. Yeah. No, but <laughs> it's hard work. It is hard work. It's not, there is no overnight success. Back, back to Ingmar Stian Mark. The, yes. the more I train, the more lucky I get. Yeah. And, and you look at some of these unicorns and, oh, they got so big in one year. No, hard work. they were hard work in 15 years and then they got yeah. the money and you saw or you they saw have like a, a good news. backup from That's beginning. You like notice. if you have a very strong VC or PE behind you, it goes a little bit right. faster because they know. But then we can get into the new topic. We shouldn't start it bootstrapping versus VC, you know, mm. that, because is it really healthy all the time to take VC too early? It, it really depends, it on, depends on what on you're working with. Uh, a VC wants, well, there are more, uh, there's no venture capital, risk capital. It's mm -hmm. just, there's just money. <laughs> there's no risk money. in it. <laughs> the, 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 the lower the risk, the more capital you get. <laughs> it's like the bank. If you have money, you can loan from the bank. If you don't have money, don't even, don't even go to the bank. So venture capital is, uh, if you have a simple business model and, and you can define your market and your customer scale. and your business model and you want to scale up, yeah, go for private equity or, or VC. I think what's encouraged nowadays is entrepreneurship. And I like that. And we should encourage it, I like especially it. in Sweden, because we have this social security system that we're safe anyhow. And education <laughs> is free. So we can try a little bit more. We what's, should, we should use our system more for entrepreneurship. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. And we have a few role models that even from before, like Ikea and, and things like that, uh, big companies made by like one person in their lifetime. It's huge. I mean, but in my company did, that's amazing, amazing. And now we have all, especially when it's software mm -hmm. in, in uh, like Spotify or, um, Minecraft, just a computer Clone game, Clone. Clone. so many, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fire Nova, <laughs> just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, I settle, I mean, yeah. like the least, there are so on. many. And I think what they're, the good thing is they're giving back to entrepreneurship mm. because they are some really, really good investors. Yes, in exactly. the Swedish startup uh, ecosystem. Is, is a good example. Yeah. Selling it twice or three times. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, good businessman. Good <laughs> yeah. Man. Yeah. No, uh, he's, he's very nice. Mm. Wow. This is cool. I mean, like we're, we're, we're running out of time. We just started. We just started, uh, yeah. but I think it's the after, after work that we really need uh, to come up now. We're just turning off the camera. We're, we're continuing. The, 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 the two hours is up. playing big in Japan now. So. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to put on big in Japan yeah. and we, we're going to hear Matt's, uh, you, you, you had a guitar. plectrum. We, oh. Matt's, uh, asked who, whose guitar is this? It's your Goran, but Mats, let's get into the guitars and the keyboard. Desperado. Yeah. But before we do that, let's, we have a couple of very simple questions um, that we always want to uh, finish off with. So 
What's next for you guys privately and Vera Nova? What was next? Mm. What's happening now? I don't have a private life, but thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're in the scale up phase and that, yeah. I, I think that's fun. Yeah. Every stage in the life or, or the mature, different maturity stages of a company is really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah, being, being a teenager, that's problematic. Uh, growing up is also really fascinating yeah. because now we, now we have this problem of, about conquering the world, scaling up, going out internationally. It's always, you always learn something new for every step you take. This so, is good with entrepreneurship. Cool. So now we're in this scale up phase. And I yeah. think that's, so that, is that, you know, going different, more markets or deeper in a couple of markets or I, I didn't want to say it, but it's about uh, now is making money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say scale up is, is scaling up uh, and also scaling down on different initiatives. Yeah. Core focus. focus. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, to talk that business lingo, yeah. but that, that's one of the things. And then it's the um, balancing between bootstrapping and, and finding yeah. new capital. Staying and childish while, while growing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Keep, keep the science, yeah. the scientific yeah. spirit when yeah. introducing and the processes and routines. And go back to this, never lose this. No. Mm -hmm. What's the fundament? Okay. We have the technology, we have the data and so forth, but without team. the heart and the team heart, and so forth. Passion. We can trash it. Yeah. Family. I mean, we're working in medicine, but you know, it's quite easy. It's just about sleep, exercise, diet. <laughs> and if you add some friendship and love in it, you don't need any medicines. <laughs> you know? So it's just to try to simplify your life and enjoy what you're doing. Like if you work with your passion, that's the best thing in, I love in life. So. It's another t-shirt, I think. You know. Yeah. Work with your passion. Yeah. Oh, which which yeah. one? That's, that's and um, last question. You know, who should we have on the podcast next? Do you have any recommendations? You, you highlighted maybe some of your superstars. Uh, I, I think we, yeah, I think I could come up with uh, three or four people you should have here. So, so, so you do some name dropping. Dive, but deep diving in, in the- Yeah, you, you, how many can you so fit on this side of no. the table? But uh, two or three, I would say. So uh, Gustav, uh, head of R&D, he knows artificial intelligence. Uh, Martin, can I go? Yeah. Martin is doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. Ida yeah. Maria, soon Ida to be Maria. professor in image analysis. That's would, three. Yeah, I would say Saba Hussein Gore to get yeah. the application specialist mm. theme yeah. of so, it. So basically you're only pitching Veronova people right now. <laughs> oh, no, oh, you no, 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 no. I'm just now. pitching geniuses <laughs> 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 who are knowledgeable about what you do. Ah, okay. Yeah, because I think we missed something. I, we didn't dig deep into the, the you know, computer science and artificial yeah. intelligence, more about the application. But if yes. you want to dig deep into, you know, they yeah, can great. talk. talk uh, that could it. be fun. We, yes. we, because we want the balance between the business, the regulatory and the real hardcore AI mm. nerdy stuff. Mm. Yeah. So because let's, both, both are necessary. Both I mean, are necessary. Yeah, basic mm. research and, and applications. All right. Mm. I think that's a wrap and thank you for an awesome conversation. And now we continue. Off camera. Thank, Thank you for your hospitality. It was yeah. great being here. This was oh, very awesome. Yeah. Very Cheers cool. to Goran. Yoran. Goran. 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 Yeah. Goran. Thank you yeah. for facilitating. Great. Take care, guys. Cheers. Bye bye.